Hey everybody, so I had just a burning question that I decided to ask Reddit really quick in the middle of session, and they just told me to play a different game, and I got mad and walked away from the table. So session's canceled. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. Always happens. <laughs> Reddit does say that very often, actually. No joke. They do actually say that <laughs> Reddit is often the response. <laughs> As someone who looks at the RPG su- RPG subreddits quite a lot, I yeah, that is yeah, often a response. Yeah, uh, yeah, for the most innocuous thing, it's like uh, how do I how, how do I like deal with advantage disadvantage play different game? Yeah, <laughs> how, do, how do I deal with uh, how do I deal with calculating CR? Play just don't play game. a different game. Yeah, just play a different game yeah. that doesn't use CR. <laughs> You're like I, what? <laughs> That's not what I asked. Yeah. But also play a different uh, I'm game. having a problem with my DM. What do we do? Play a game without a DM. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Play Microscope. There's no DM. Anyway. Oh, uh, fuck. Um, I figured uh, as it is my first time back uh, for the back last four weeks. Back in the uh, saddle again. I was the war. See, I thought you were going to do Backstreet's back. No. All no. Right. That's, that's way too. Uh, I don't like Backstreet Boys. I don't know what to tell you. Sir, the Fair number enough. one reporting artist in all of China. <laughs> what? Are you serious? Yeah, they're they're, they're fucking omega huge in China. <sighs> I yeah, I'm not even I'm not even memeing it. That big kinda, so weird. That begs me yeah. so many questions. I so, yeah, I know. So, and Big's apparently similar. in certain countries, they're like 30 years behind when it comes to like the music times. So like, but why back 30 years ago when the Backstreet Boys were ginormous but they weren't the biggest now. but even in their heyday they weren't the biggest country the biggest musical act in like america like uh, they were big I'm not, I'm not but they sure. weren't the I was, biggest i was an sync kind of kid you know i, I mean, wasn't a timberlake kind of life that's fair mm. i just all right china that's intriguing i don't yeah I, do you, china? Why? yeah i mean them i mean them having delayed music coming over there makes sense in the same way that like you know we used to get like japanese games later than than japan released them and stuff like that i get but backstreet boys specifically (laughs) it's not even that they didn't get them they got backstreet boys when we got them at the same time it's just they weren't as popular until now for whatever reason this this feels like one of those weird internet rabbit holes you could go down yeah. yeah, this is definitely an iceberg for sure. It feels like one. Yeah, I'm not going to, but it feels like one. I'm, I'm, right. I'm now almost tempted to, but I probably won't. I won't. It's not worth it. I don't do it. Okay, Matt. You can. You know, this is not worth it, Matt, uh, Josh. But Telling people where they can find us. No, I would say that's very much worth it, as they have already found <laughs> us, and they can follow or subscribe on the thing they have already found us on, which is the podcast platform they are currently listening on. Very much worth it. Oh, yeah, that, that's that's why there's no point. Boom. There's no point in telling them, because they already know where to find us. Yes, but hit the follow or subscribe button. There is a point to that. Yes, there is a point to that, for There's sure. very much a point to that. Isaiah's not helping here. Don't listen to him. Listen to me. <laughs> Isaiah also right. didn't introduce us. It's true, I didn't. Uh, hi, everybody. It's me, Isaiah. Uh, we, well, we've been doing this for 100 episodes. Now it feels, At this point, if you don't know, this, it's me. I, this I'm feels not, awkward now. Now but this feels it's weird. It's a special anniversary 100th episode. Let's go. It's way... Oh, it's going to be a dog shit 100th anniversary. <laughs> Let me tell you. I, this, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, no expectations. But also, this is way past anniversary, Matt. Like, way, way yeah, past. I know. <laughs> we're, we're two years I was deep. bringing back the meme when I kept saying it with the 50th anniversary episode. I don't think you keep saying that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> I, know. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> but, uh... Alright, uh, that being said, uh, as my first time back in a while, well, I figured he might Isaiah as well... introduced himself and not us. Did I not? No, you just said Isaiah, <laughs> and then you just kept talking. Ah, fair enough. Yeah, sorry. Uh, me but Josh. Hello. Aggressively. And Matt. Tell me why... Uh, no, I don't know. No, no, no. I don't like the way you said that. It just sounded like a sad breakup and not. <laughs> That's the point. That's Tell the point me why. That... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But yeah. Uh, up, I haven't you been here for a while. The rest of the song. <laughs> so I figure right. we come back with style and we do another uh, dive through <laughs> the just... internet uh, takes questions and uh, I was just joking again, to death. concerns. I'll do that. Uh, <laughs> she <lied on> <laughs> I said, oh, God. 
I'm sorry. <coughs> Matt made yeah, me choke thought- on my drink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. Matt almost just killed me live. Holy shit. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine now, but I'm going to fucking strangle Matt. Jesus. Uh, oh, this is nothing new. That's true. Yeah. Gone without me. So what are we talking okay. about today, okay. AJ? Well, you know, it's, I'm happy that you asked because, uh, I, like I said, uh, I figured we'd come back strong with another deep dive into the internet's burning questions, uh, ideas, and thoughts about the RPG hobby, uh, mm-hmm. specifically D&D, but other, you know, other things as well. Yep. Uh, but rather than spicy slash shit takes i figured Mm -hmm. i would this time peruse the general uh questions uh, aimed towards uh gms dms masters of ceremonies storytellers whatever you want to call whoever the fuck is running your game all right no 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 i refuse to use the white wolf storyteller one i hate that shit (laughs) i'll call the (laughs) i will call the person running the game a lot of dumb shit but god do i hate storyteller i'm I'm not gonna lie i hate master of ceremonies even more I, yeah, I don't like that one either. All right, fuck y'all. <laughs> <laughs> You're both wrong, but that's fine. <laughs> what, about, what about the Baldur's Gate narrator? No, because you're not a fucking narrator. That's not what you're doing. You're not a storyteller, and you're not a narrator. All right, actually, wait. Between I mean, the two part of your job ones, is to narrate what is prefer, going on. Do you guys prefer Dungeon Master or Game Master? Why, Matt, you've asked us this multiple times. Have I? Yes. I don't remember what I've said each of those times, but I'm going to go just, with Game Master for now. I just say Game Master because it's generic and applies to everything. Mm. Very simple. And also, you know, a lot of people don't even run dungeons in 5e anyway anymore. So Master works better anyway. But also, who the fuck cares? Uh, I, you know, I do... I, <laughs> I do like the acronym DM because if you say you're sliding into your DM and you're not talking like if you're talking to your typical RPG crew, they're going to be like, I'm sorry, what? And then you're, you're going to yeah, you're really sliding awkwardly. into your dungeon <laughs> master. Really yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then people are <laughs> like, wait, I'm sorry. What? And you're going to go. Yeah. yeah. No, wait, no, no. Like, no, like direct. Me- not like no shit. <laughs> like I'm sliding into my DM. You're not even buying me dinner. First. Yeah. Yeah. Your uh, your girlfriend just <laughs> looks you across the table. Your girlfriend looks at you across the table and says, or your boyfriend looks at you from across the table and just says, I'm sliding into the DM. And you just look at them and go, what, what? <laughs> what is it? The the one meme? It's like, I knew you were having sex. And it's like, wait, we were? Why did you tell me I would have put my book down? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? I don't remember what that's from. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's like an old like a uh, fam like TV sitcom where it was two girls and one of them kicks the door in uh, trying to catch her her roommate like getting laid. And it's the boyfriend and the girlfriend doing their home, like actually doing their homework. Uh, and she's like, I knew you were having sex. And the girlfriend's like, we were? Maybe you should have told me I would have put my book down. <laughs> and there he's there just confused. Also confused. Yeah, it's great. I'm actually confused you've never seen it. That's like a really old meme. I Weird. don't talk about, but okay. I'll have to find it after this. Okay. Mm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, without further ado, I think we might as well. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm just gonna <laughs> just gonna raw dog into that one. Yeah, yeah. Just like you're sliding into your DM. Yeah. Yeah. Raw dog it. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, so Reddit questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so before we get into it, I have some rules, as I usually do. Oh, great! There's a gnat in the room. So. Anyway, got a few rules. I don't like Isaiah. Um, I never like when Isaiah makes rules, just like when teachers make rules. Mm, yeah. <laughs> no, re- no retort <laughs> on that one, huh? Statement made. He's yeah. just like, statement made. It's like, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I was going to say right. that it's like that one time we accidentally set off that gunpowder in the science room. That kid will never breathe again. For legal reasons, this is a joke. Um, For legal reasons, this is a joke. I did actually set off gunpowder in my chemistry class. It was the experiment for the day, though, and I was the only one who got the mixture right. Nice. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. He was like, you know, I expected everyone to fail that, but you got it. High five, kid. And I was like, 
fuck yeah. And then he went, don't do this at home. And I was like, Jesus. it's too late. I've already taken a picture of the outline. <laughs> I will. Mm-hmm. I'll do this at home. I will. <laughs> I will do this at home. Uh, but yeah. So like I said, we got a few rules. Um, first one, pretty simple. Uh huh. We the the whole point of this is to work within the lines. Now, mm-hmm. if someone is uh, system agnostic, if they if they've given a description of their problem but they have not said what system they're using, obviously you can um, recommend a system to do it with. So if mm-hmm. someone's like, I need a way to sort of figure out how to invent this crazy contraption and then you can be like oh well blades has the clock system you can do x y and z in that but if someone's like all right well i'm trying to like invent a fucking metal gear in D D, you can't be like we'll play blades in the dark loser you know I, I i want i just want you to know i'll abide by these rules for the sake of humanity uh but this this displeases me i know but I'll do it. Uh, another thing that you're not allowed to say is just don't. I- <laughs> All right. That was going to be even my fallback. A- that was going to be my fallback answer. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Even if it's a really, really bad idea. Yeah. We like can't, We can't shut I, it down. Damn. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Fine. Okay. I, I, I will. I will amend the rules. If the three of us can agree that the answer is just don't, then we can collectively say just don't. Fair, fair, <laughs> All right, fair, fine. Or fair. you can abstain from answering. I will give you that. If you genuinely can't figure something out, I'm not going to like force an answer out of you. I mean, I don't think there's any scenario where I'm not going to have some kind of an answer. Mm. That seems fair unlikely. Enough, but I just put it there just in case. Fine. All right. Oh, uh. For the, the record, we will not be round robining this. I will just be uh, reading out the title line and then the actual issue. Some of these are quite long. I um, will, however, be rounding your robin. Nice. Mm. You gonna pay me first? No. And I do not consent, sir. I'm cheap, huh? Drug. Damn, he really just said your consent is unnecessary. That's crazy. I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get him! <laughs> Cancel. Canceled. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, without further ado, we're going to start with the first one. Uh, question number one. How do you deal with homicidal characters? Description. I'm okay with a good deal of murder. I've made characters with dubious moral qualities and run games with plenty of combat and killing in mind. Lately, though, it seems like my players are more bloodthirsty than usual. I wouldn't mind if I was if it was an isolated to a one time game or across, but, but it's been across multiple games and it feels like the theme is to kill everyone you meet. Antagonists who I envision to be long term threats woven in and out of the narrative are killed in the session they're introduced because murder is always taking precedent over diplomacy. It creates a whole villain of the week vibe, which I'm not a fan of. A complaint I got way back was that the villains don't have much staying power and I had to stop myself and think, yeah, because you killed them all the moment you met. In my world, there are high-tech police and law enforcement, but I don't want to just break into their homes and claim the cops have been working behind the scenes, nor do I want consequences to feel like cheap karma. The answer isn't necessarily bigger villain, because the dice are always in their favor. For the future, I'm filtering out the loner sociopaths for my game, but for now, I'm not sure how to proceed. It's starting to get on my nerves that my games are just serial killer simulators, and I'm not out for revenge. Mm. Yet. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the reoccurring wait, 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 like, wait, 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 villain wait. thing. Oh. Wait, question. Okay. Sorry, hold on. No, this is an important question, Matt. I did cut you off for no reason. <clears throat> Who or, or, Is this targeted at one of us to answer, or is this open season? This is open season. In The ones that, are, uh, that specifically pertain to you, you will know that they pertain to you, but you do not feel like you must answer them. Just know that they were for you. <laughs> Oh, and, and or comment okay. in a funny way if you notice. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, go, uh, Matt, say what you were gonna say. Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna. Uh, the only thing I was really gonna say is like the whole reoccurring villain thing is a problem in a lot of tabletop games. It is. What yeah. I've heard the simplest solution is to just say fuck it, even if the players found the body, you know. 
they come back as a clone or oh, you kill the clone or the Doctor Doom thing where it's just another robot. It, the players might get annoyed at it, but honestly, if it seems like your players are homicidal maniacs <laughs> and I guess that's the vibe of your game, then they need to stop killing people because otherwise your villains are all just going to be Doom bots and your players are going to have to suck a nut. Um, okay, fair enough. I mean, here's what I think. <clears throat> You're not wrong in that, Matt, in that statement, but uh, mm. I, I almost feel like that's not really the crux of the problem here. No, that was just the one point that's, that stuck out to me. But like, oh, th- this is a whole like, this is it. I think this is. Yeah, this goes beyond. I can answer yeah. like this is yeah i mean the murder hobo party is a is a meme for a reason right like but that should be something you guys discuss usually like i get I, I don't know again if you do a session zero or a pre-campaign thing it where, should like, be dis- talks, discussed in some fashion yes. yeah yeah like if it was one of those like bait and switch things where your players were like all right we're gonna be you know rogue paladin fucking bard going off on adventures and then oh no they turn out to be like serial killers after like a session or two then it's like okay guys tone totally flip the fuck like we're supposed to be playing uh war deep dragon heist and you guys are just murdering everybody like you're in fucking curse of fraud yeah i mean the 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 person who posted this said right from the jump i'm not out for revenge yet which i assume what they mean by that is like i'm not gonna do the gm thing where you just like throw seven dragons at them just to shit on their day for funsies or whatever they're trying to avoid doing that which is good because you should avoid doing that it doesn't help the problem anyone whose response to this is just you know attack them with 10 death knights that is not that doesn't help um you could do the mean thing and throw like something so powerful that they can't even kill it and then just have the thing with the villain like lets them go you know no i don't think that's that's the movie there because that's kind of the same problem of like you just shit on their day just to be a mean gm type thing you know like that doesn't feel so it's it's one of those like you're trying to i don't even want i don't know if i want to say like teach a lesson but it's one of those like there are stronger things your consequences have actions like you know Soft Lord, the Death Knight, is gonna come over and, and smack you around if you keep fucking. My man just said Soft Lord. Yeah, soft Lord, I was I was trying original, not to say anything, but yes, he did. Soft, soft Lord, Lord, the did Death not, Knight. Soft Lord. Dude, uh, so, you mean, so do you mean don't you mean Moth Mord? Yeah, yeah, yeah Moth Mord. Yeah. Or, or 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 Mord Moth. Yeah, Mord do not Moth. steal. Fucking police officer comes around yeah. town. You your guys are you know, your pull your players keep you know stabbing every NPC they meet there and they interact with. Like eventually, like. You could throw a big bad cop at them, not to kill well, them. Obviously, I think you could but take. Like, I, you could tackle this on multiple levels. I think yeah, step yeah. one is you have to establish on what level of the game do you want to deal with this problem, and by level I mean, do you want to deal with this problem on the player to GM level? like on a personal human being to other human beings level do you want to deal with this level on an in you want to deal with this on a uh a sort of meta textual level where everyone knows you're doing dumb shit but you're all kind of accepting the dumb shit or do you want to deal with this on an in world in game level where you keep things sort of logically consistent and then sort of establish the consequences from that standpoint because so i th- personally i think the easiest way to deal with this problem and this is i almost hate saying this because this is just always the fucking answer but like pause the game talk to your players as other human beings and say i greatly dislike that you are doing this and you guys have complained about how my villains don't feel like they matter or don't have staying power and part of the reason they do not matter and do not have staying power is because you guys are a bunch of psychopathic serial killers so perhaps we could meet in the middle a little bit you could still be psychopathic serial killers but perhaps have your characters reel it in a little a bit so I can establish some villains. You know what I'm saying, Mario? I don't know why that happened. I don't know where I went with the Mario thing. This is the second time I, you've, you broke it out into <laughs> accent today. I don't know what that was. On a metatextual level, you can just, if your players 
are doing wacky woohoo serial killer nonsense, then you can respond as a GM with wacky woohoo insane stuff happening to the players. You could be like, ah, three dragons show up and start fucking with you or whatever. You know, like you could take it to that meta textual level and just have both sides of the table doing nonsensical sort of logic breaking type crap. If you want to deal with it on the in universe level, which I feel like this person is trying to deal with it on an in game in universe level based on how they're phrasing it. I don't know that for a fact, but that's sort of what I'm getting from how they explained it. I mean, they mentioned, so they said, in my world, there are high-tech police and law enforcement, but I don't just want to break into their home and claim the cops have been working behind the scenes, nor do I want consequences to feel like cheap karma. I think you should just do that. If you want to keep this on an in-universe, in-game level and show the players there are consequences, I think you should have your high-tech police and law enforcement. If that's, here's the thing. If you've already established that as a thing in your setting, then you are within reason, you are within your right, within your bounds to say the high tech police law enforcement people have been working behind the scenes. They are now coming after your ass because, quite frankly, that's how it works in real life. Uh, uh, somebody murders somebody and the police do hours and hours of work behind the scenes and then they go arrest the guy. It's not like, you know. It's not like if they don't see the murder happen, they just give up, right? They do work behind the scenes. That's what that's part of what law enforcement does. So I think you actually should just do that in this case. It, it could be a really cool thing where like you have the one police detective who's like on their ass at all times. He's like, listen, we have a really big like, you know, just saying like it's very real coincidence that you guys just happen to be here during yeah. crimes. Have all a, these guys, he starts listing off every fucking thing. Yeah, have like a Sherlock Holmes character who's just on yeah, their shit yeah. at all times. The only thing is, the only thing is, this is going to dramatically shift the tone of your game. Whatever your game about yeah. was was about before. Now it's, it's about off. this. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your game was about defeating Lord Darkamon, the, the Lord of the Seven Dragons. Not anymore, motherfucker. Now it's about your players being serial killers, right? Like, that's what's going to happen if you respond on an in-universe, in-game level. This person did also say, I'm filtering out loner sociopaths from my game, which I'm assuming what they're saying is, I'm looking for new players. I think that's a nice way of them saying, I'm going to look yeah, for new I'm, players. I'm removing yeah. the problem players and I'm looking for yeah. new ones. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they're already aware of that part of it. But if you want to, I mean, look, I'm going to be honest. If I came across this problem, I would talk to the players. And if they said, no, we want to be serial killers, my response genuinely be the game is over. Then I'm not running that game. Find someone who wants to run that game because I don't want to run that game. You know what I mean? But if you want to try and stick it out and you want to stick it out in in a consistent in universe way, then, yes, I think utilizing the high-tech police force and making the high-tech police force the new main villain or more maybe it's more accurate to say your players are the main villain and the high-tech police force are the good guys chasing them whatever then yeah just do that and how you can avoid the whole oh the players just kill all my cool villains well if the high-tech police force already knows your players are psychopathic murderers they're not going to send you know they're like there's a reason the police chief doesn't go and do the drug bust because the police chief might get shot by the by the crips if he goes to go and drug bust the house so they don't send the police chief right so if you're already dealing with that the the sort of whatever the equivalent of the police chief is becomes your new villain your antagonist to the players he does not put himself in the enemy lines. He does not put himself in front of their weapons because that would be fucking dumb. There's no scenario where he would ever do that, especially if they know these players are a bunch of sociopaths. Like, you, it just doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, they wouldn't do that. So I would just lean into yep. that. And is it going to feel right, a so little bullshitty? Maybe, but like, your players are being a little bullshitty. So... 
Yeah. yeah I and mean, you have to respond with. So I, I think the, the thing that a lot of people and, and maybe it's not that they don't understand it, but it is a difficult balance to match is, you, you know, if your players are are responding with a certain level of force, you have to respond in turn with the same amount of force. Right. Killing them outright is way too much. Doing nothing is way too little. Yeah. But if they are killing people and even if like, let's say this one of the villains in question is like. Uh, a dirty cop, right? Or like a mob boss. And he wants to meet them at a at a restaurant and to be like, hey, look, you know, it's just the business. It is what it is. And they shoot him in the face. No one knows that that guy's a mob boss. They just shot that dude in the face. Arrest their asses, you know? Yeah. Um, on a, on a highly simplified note, and I really have to specify this is a highly simplified and it might not be the best answer, um, but it has, it has actually helped me think about things. Uh, I've done this myself. Don't give the villain hit points. Don't give them a stat block. That character is a villain, but they are also a narrative device. I mean, so you yeah. you will have to rely on a certain amount of your ability to improv as to why that character can't be killed. So like, let's say if you got the mob boss and they try to shoot him, you can be like, oh, well, one of his lackeys was waiting for you to do something. And he jumps in front of the gun and gets shot. Now you killed somebody. This guy looks completely innocent and you're in trouble. Are you going to try to shoot him again and potentially have two crimes on you? Or are you can be like, oh, shit, and run away, you know? Yeah, basically. I mean, it, it, I don't even think it so much matters if you give them like that's kind of almost like a plot armor thing, which is, you know, to a certain degree can be OK sometimes, particularly when you like plot armor feels stupid in like books and movies and stuff because the the writer has ultimate control but you as a gm do not have ultimate control so utilizing a little bit of plot armor to keep things going smoothly is not like that unreasonable you know yeah i i think personally uh, a certain amount of plot armor in a tabletop rpg makes a lot of sense and as long as you don't abuse it it's pretty fair it's like, a tool in your toolbox. If box. you're fighting Lord Soth the Death Knight, right? No, no, more, more. And your fighter sort, yeah, you're more, more the 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 the, the meth, mark the meth, um, the meth might. Yeah, yeah. Um, and your and your fighter's like, I'm gonna get him, and he pulls out his sword and swings. I mean, if even if he rolls a natural twenty, right? You can be like, yeah, you scratched his armor. Or if you does if they don't roll a natural twenty, you can be like, ah, yes, he he pulls out his long sword and parries your blow, and then like, he kicks you in the chest and sends you flying back. You know, like, yeah. as long as it makes sense in the narrative, it's fine. It's it's when it's like, ah, yes, you hit him and he teleports away. That's when it feels like incredible guard, guard. bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> that's when people are like, that doesn't make sense. But again, but if you give a fight like a, a fighting villain a parry ability. That's I just be like, ah, oh, shit, he's got one. Yeah, of it's not that un- it's not that unreasonable. But again, I think the really important thing to take out of this, if anyone who's listening runs into this scenario, because this does happen quite often, unfortunately, you you really started with a classic on this one, Isaiah. This is a very classic problem. Um, yeah. Yep, I know. If if you are going to deal with this problem on an in-game level. It is going to shift the entire tone of your game. Whatever game you had before, you ain't got that game no more. Like, there is no avoiding that. If you want to deal with something like this in game, it is going to change the campaign you are playing. Uh, End of discussion. No avoiding that. If you don't want the campaign to change, you have to do it on the player level. End of discussion. Like, there's no two ways about that. There's just no... There's no bullying your player, your player characters into being good people or whatever. <laughs> that just ain't happening, mm-hmm. which is unfortunate, but truly, you know, it's just itty what yeah, basically, yeah, pretty much. That's all I got to add on that one. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we answered it pretty concisely. I'm <laughs> glad I haven't had to run into this problem. <laughs> Yeah, I have not either. Thank God. Mm. Have you, Matt? Uh, no, my players are. It comes and goes. Sometimes <laughs> they'll be a little more murdery than the not. Sometimes they'll try to do the good thing. 
So typical chaos, chaos gremlin behavior. Yeah, I mean with Strixhaven, mm-hmm. it's not. There's not a lot of like, you know, most of the time they're fighting monsters, so it's okay to like, you know, they're like, oh, we'll kill them. Not like they're dealing with a lot of humanoids, and the ones they are dealing with, most of the time they're able to talk them down, or they end up being made of like, you know, a blood clone or something because blood. I mean, it's also worth pointing out that the the response of the player characters to be like, oh, the villain is standing in front of us. We should probably kill him now to solve all our problems. That's like a very reasonable mm-hmm. response to have from a purely logic based mm-hmm. standpoint. The idea from of a video game. Yeah, no, no, not even a video game. Like, think about it purely in a logical standpoint, like. You know, the general of the enemy army has presented himself in front of us and is telling me how he's going to kill us all in, in, you know, and put us all to the guillotine. Just stab him now and solve the problem is a pretty reasonable response. Yeah. You know, like... I'm wondering, because I'm wondering from the post if it's like, you know, they're in Cyberpunk and it's like NPC comes up there and be like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm Vinny the, the goon. I work for the big mob boss. He would just want me to tell you to get out of his turf. And then your player's like, hmm, hmm, hmm. I pull up my sick katana and I stab this goon in the throat in the throat. I <laughs> just like, you're like, hey, but he's the messenger. <laughs> Interesting. Like, you assume this is a cyberpunk type game. I, I was just using as a reference. Okay, well, because here's the thing. If this was a cyberpunk game, I don't think this would be seen as a problem because it's that sort of in genre. Hmm. Like it is in genre hilariously, and if it was cyberpunk, you literally could and reasonably should sick Max Tack on their asses. That's what Max Tack's there for. Well, I meant cyberpunk, yeah. the genre, not the setting, but yeah, basically, yeah. Like, like Max Tack is literally the my players got a little too big for their britches. I mean, yes, yep. but even even disregarding cyberpunk, the setting, cyberpunk as a genre, the sort of murder hobo serial killers to solve your problem method of things is 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 in genre it's on brand you know so i feel like this would wouldn't be seen as a problem if you're playing cyberpunk or shadow run or the sprawl or anything like that you know much like if i'm playing blades in the dark and my players are a bunch of rampant serial killers i'm not really going to be mad that's sort of on brand you know i would expect that so i i i think this is a this sounds like a D game where the the GM wanted their players to be, you know, the heroes and the players said, no, I think I'll be Jeffrey Dahmer instead. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 All right. Y'all ready for number two? Are you ready for number two? What no, does no, number two work for? <laughs> number one. Jeez, why didn't I think of that? I just love that part of the movie. <laughs> He's like, Jesus, man, you got to hold on. You're going to blow out your O-ring. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? I was talking about Codename Austin Kids Next Door. Austin Powers. So there's a it, in Austin Powers. Obviously, Dr. Evil's uh, second in command is called number two. Yeah, with the oh, and there's an, I didn't know. Yeah, that. there's the Irish assassin dude in the first movie with a, a bracelet that has his lucky charms on it. And he tries garrot wiring. Uh. Austin Powers, Austin Powers the who then proceeds stall. to swirly him to death yep. in the toilet. Uh, and he's like, who does number two work for? And the cowboy dude he met in Vegas, don't worry about it, is sitting in the stall next to him. Mm. And he just thinks that Austin Powers is like shitting his brains. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. Struggling to shit him. He's just like, he's like, yeah, boy, you tell him. You turn, you take that. Yeah, to yeah, 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 boy, you sure was boss. I, I, I was legitimately thinking of Codename Kids Next Door, but okay. All right. We went in very different directions with that one. Very much. Have you seen Austin Powers, Josh? Oh, you should watch those it's movies. another movie night. Yeah. My favorite is Goldmember, personally. Um, I think I've seen a little bit of Goldmember. It is the best one. Uh, I'll take your I word for it. I kind of like two more. I don't know. What? You like the spy who shagged me more than Goldmember? Yeah, Goldmember was fun, but I don't know. There's some, some about two. I feel like two was the weakest. I love Maybe. gold. I know that meme. I love gold. My shrinky was a key. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know that one. <laughs> I love 
that Michael Caine of all people is, is his like dad, his dad. Is even hotter and fucks even better than him. Is, but it's fucking Alfred <laughs> from the Dark Knight. <laughs> is Goldmember the one where it's like I got sharks with freaking laser beams? No, that's so, the no, first yes, one. Yes, oh, technically. Yeah, kind of, yeah. The first one is when he wants the sharks with freaking laser beams attached Gold to their when he heads. gets them. Yeah, and then when he yeah when his yeah. son gives them to him yeah yeah it, it is a very good roundabout yeah, yeah. like joke yeah yeah oh, yeah gotta love those movies all right on to the next one nah. <laughs> number two uh, number encounter two. lengths and crunch description this might be a bit early but I see this problem come up uh, coming up soon in my group so I thought I might as well ask before the problem comes up a little background. I have been running my group for almost a year now. We've had one or two, uh, two or three week breaks uh, because of life and stuff, but I try to meet at least twice each month, if not four times for pretty long sessions, depending on a uh, concentration of five or six hours. Oh, Assuming boy. Assuming session Christ. times of five or six hours. Okay. That's a long... I have been running Call of Cthulhu and Monster of the Week for three to four players. Wait, what? Hold on. Now, what? So running two games... Two different games? Two, yeah, two different games. I don't know if this means simultaneously or swapping back. At yeah, yeah I don't know if, he, if he's running one game a week for two weeks. So it's like one. So they're pl he's, they're playing one session a month of each game, potentially. Maybe or eight sessions a month for each. Okay, that's how I read. Okay. It. Um, now I suggested a little break from Call of Cthulhu since I'm a little burnt out, but I love the campaign. I feel my energy to do, but sorry, but I feel my hand, my energy to do handouts and stuff grew a little smaller. I think they still love the adventure, but I don't feel as inspired. I write each adventure of the campaign myself. Uh, now we will probably, we will soon probably play the beginner box of D and D they gifted me for Christmas. And if they enjoy fantasy, I would like to play Pathfinder with them since I got the PDFs of the books. It'll be their first D20 system and their first fantasy system. They talked about being interested in something fantasy based before. My group of three likes some action, but also roleplay, two of which uh, enjoy roleplay, but they're a bit shy, uh, though they're still doing great. One player likes crunch, and in the systems I ran, I added maps and different ways he can prep and be more tactical. The other two see fights more as a great set piece and exciting, if not dangerous situations, but they're not very tactical about it. Now my worry is the length of the encounters and how to make sure I have a nice balance. Do any game masters have tips or insight on how long encounters go and if Pathfinder and or D&D can be somewhat roleplay heavy, taking three or four combat session uh, combat encounters max in a session and it doesn't last too long, except maybe bigger fight because BBEG and stuff. I really should have done a better job at fixing the grammar because this is fucking me up. Yeah, you're, you're reading something different than you wrote down. You're throwing me off. Yeah, my bad. Uh, maybe I because I, my brain is trying to autocorrect on the I fly. I see that. Uh, maybe I'm getting uh, too into my own head about it, uh, but I'm just a bit curious because I want the best experience for my group. Sorry if I got a bit rambly, but I wanted to give the background and I'm happy to hear any and all input and ideas on the inside. This feels yeah, like there's, three there's questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I just. This isn't really relevant to the question, but I just want to say real quick. I. This is a pet peeve. I fucking. Mm -hmm. I fucking hate. I hate when people refer to system by the type of dice fucking hate when people say this shit oh it's a d20 Why? system it's a 2d6 system it's a dice pool of d10s i don't fucking care what type of dice it uses telling me the type of dice doesn't tell me anything about how the resolution mechanics actually work because the statement it, here's the thing the statement it's a d20 system that doesn't tell me anything about how the game functions just because a game uses D20. D&D uses a D20. Modifius games use D20s. They use completely different resolution systems. Modifius games use a dice pool of D20s. You could have up to like four or five D20s in a dice pool. D&D uses a single D20 where you add modifiers. Those are two completely different resolution systems that work in completely different ways. They just happen to use the same type of dice. I don't give a shit what kind of die you use. It's not useful information. Sounds like a you problem. It right? is a you. I mean, it's not a me problem. I think people just <laughs> I just get fucking annoyed because I feel like people focus on the wrong thing. They see the type of dice and think that tells them about what kind of like they think all D20 systems are the same and all D6 mm. systems are the same and they 
fucking aren't the type of dice. A dice is just a mathematical thing. It, it, it's the equivalent of thinking that like all arithmetic is the same. Like, no, motherfucker, the way you utilize the calculation and the the uh, shit. What's the word I'm looking for? The way you utilize the equation. Thank you. I, who am I saying thank you to? Myself? Yeah, I was like, who are I'm you thanking thinking? myself for being such a fucking genius. <laughs> the way you utilize the equation is how you get different types of answers. Dice systems are equations. The type of die are just variables in the equation. I don't fucking care about the variable. I want to know what kind of equation I'm using. Now we can go on to the actual question. Math is fucking math, kids. Right. Anyway. Uh... Let, let's break this down, I guess. Into it like, does feel like we need to break this down. Yeah. <laughs> like, so the yes. first part where it's like the two to three games, five to six hours each playing two different systems. I, <sighs> okay. Can, like, how do you, how do you, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep it a buck chief. Uh, yeah. It seems like this person, this person is trying probably to was do not built to run too many set like two games at once. It seems like you obviously don't like running the second one. I'm not going to make as much. I'm not going to make that assumption. But what I will say is I think this person's trying to do too many things at once. Like, yeah, first of all, Enjoy. Call of Cthulhu and Monster of the Week. Stylistically are 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 just such different like you're trying to do X-Files and Supernatural at the same time. Those aren't the same thing. They feel like they might be the same thing, but they are not the same thing. So that's already confusing me. I don't understand what the game split. They didn't say if they're doing it with two different groups or the same group or what. So I'm a little confused about that. I part. I'm going to assume, gonna it's, assume the it's the group? same group because it said two or three players. And they're only referencing three, three players player. across the yeah. entire True. thing. Uh, three to True. four. Yeah, they're True. only... I'm assuming like because they like we meet what twice each month, if not four times. So like I the hypothetical, let's say if it's two times a month, it's one game a piece. One week is Cthulhu. One week, one is, week is Monster, Monster of the week. week. Right. Or I two mean, and two. if you're meeting. If you're also, meeting five to six hours is a lot. Of five to six hours is long, but some people, you know, whatever. Some people enjoy that. And also it's not as long if you're playing in person, you know, like play, I think playing in person, it's easier to go for longer sessions. Mm -hmm. I feel like if you're meeting. Huh, my brain, if you're <laughs> if you're meeting twice a week. OK. Caveat, I haven't played Call of Cthulhu, my no so my knowledge of Call of Cthulhu is very secondhand. But I have played Monster of the Week. I am relatively familiar with Monster of the Week. I feel like if you're meeting twice a week, just stick with Monster of the Week because Monster of the Week is a really great game for groups that don't meet very often or groups that have rather short sessions. Monster of the Week is very good for both of those things. So I would just lean into Monster of the Week and... Since you're already saying I want a break from Call of Cthulhu, just stop playing Call of Cthulhu. Just play Monster of the Week, my guy. And if you want to get some of the Call of Cthulhu vibe vibe into Monster of the Week, then just do a little tweaking, hack Monster of the Week a, week a little bit and get some of that Call of Cthulhu vibe. I don't think that would be very hard because Monster of the Week is is essentially the more action focused version of a Call of Cthulhu kind of game anyway. And if you want to mm -hmm. just Lovecrafty and horror it that that would not be hard to to stick in the game so just play monster of the week <laughs> is what I'm feeling here but then they dropped Pathfinder and D&D &D on us yeah I uh, so I want to break Is from Call of, huh yeah no no we're gonna go for it I want to break from Call of Cthulhu I don't feel inspired blah 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 whatever fine we're going to play the beginner box of D&D. &D. If they like fantasy, I would like to play Pathfinder. I'm going to be honest. I'm a little confused about that. I, what? Why would you try one and then play like it? it I think Pathfinder it, has a it, starter thing, too. It, Pathfinder has a starter set. It does. Just play the Pathfinder starter set if you want to go. Yeah, Pathfinder. It, it, it's it's kind of strange to be like, let's play okay, D&D &D and, and then so I can play Path unless Pathfinder. I don't I guess the idea would be play D&D &D because it's a little a little bit more rules light than Pathfinder is to prep them for the more 
crunchiness of Pathfinder. I don't, I don't think that's which I can understand, really but like it is a crunchy. lot of. Work. I don't think only one of one of his guys wants crunch anyways. That too, but also I don't think that's actually a good way to do that because first of all, they're two different systems. And second of all, like learning one system and then on ramping to a different system, I, it, it, like it, I don't. That doesn't without like playing a couple of sessions of one system and then on ramping to another is like not necessary. It just doesn't totally make sense to me. I don't really see what you're trying to do there. And I get they got it for you for Christmas. So maybe you just want to run the beginner box because they your players played paid for it so you feel but like if they like the fantasy of DD, just keep playing D. &D. don't yeah. try to s just keep playing D, D, and then once you're done deal with D, D, maybe then consider playing pathfinder but to do this like mid switchy thing feels weird and like i get it you paid for the pathfinder pdfs but they're not going anywhere it's okay you can play later you know like i don't know you can also take some of the ideas from pathfinder and Again, five. You know, I'm, I'm make the meaning five E so malleable. You can use some of the Pathfinder um, stuff, and then do it in five E or vice versa. Like, sort, kinda, yeah. You, I mean, you can't. I, the thing is, Pathfinder's already taking so many things from D and D that, like, I don't know how many things you could really take from Pathfinder. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're like already doing so many similar things. Like, let's say hypothetically, one of the PDF he has a uh, one of the adventure paths. You just oh, you could steal that kind of content. Sure, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I'm saying. Like, yeah, yeah, like adventure content. Yeah, that's true. When it comes to like core races and stuff, it's like that is They're like the same. <laughs> yeah, it's like okay, I can do that, or I can reskin shit. Like again, just reskin like so much shit. And there you I'm go. also uh, so. And then they said, my group of three likes action, but also role play. Two players enjoy role play. The other one's a bit shy, but they're doing blah blah, blah whatever. One player likes crunch. And in the systems I ran, I added maps in different ways he could prep to be more tactical. And then the other players are like not that tactical. They see the fights as fun set pieces. Right. Just just don't play Pathfinder, my guy. Like, keep, yeah, keep to the D&D. &D if you only and have. Yeah, I would say if you have one player who wants that crunch, don't play Pathfinder <laughs> with this group. Yeah, and I will group. say that is one of D&D's few very good strengths, right? Is like the big set piece vices. Spices, fights. big set piece fights. Yes. Yeah, it does do that very well, for the um, most part. Yes. That being said, I, I get what you're trying to do with the three to four combat sessions per round or per day. Bro, that's a lot. Unless session. you're doing dungeon but crawling. Yeah, I I really don't think this per. And to be fair, he probably doesn't understand how long combat takes mm -hmm. in D and D. Unless especially ridiculously es short and very easy, or you know, you could throw. A Tarask at the bat, you, know, you know, maybe not Tarask, but like, what the fuck is it called? The Garion at your players. If there's just one of them, yeah, it's gonna die pretty fast, and it's like it's technically a really strong monster, but that's just not how the action economy is gonna work out. They're gonna stomp that thing with no issue. Mm. Uh, I, especially if you only have, I, I don't know why I just struggled so much with that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> especially if you, if you only have one player who gets into the like tacticalness of the game, your combats are going to take even longer, right? Like, okay. I just finished a three year campaign of D and D five E where I had, I'll say three out of four players were fairly tactically minded with the fourth player sometimes would shift into tactical mode when he was in the mood. Sometimes, sometimes he would, he was be a little more out of it, but generally my group was in the tactical mindset and knew the game well. So I could throw three or four fights at them because my players knew how to make decisions really, really quickly. And when their turn came around, they knew what their best action to do for the turn was. So monsters would do their thing. I say, player A, it's your turn. Player A does their turn. Player B, it's your turn. Player B does their turn. Player C, it's your turn. Player C takes slightly longer because something shifted in the fight and then they're done. Player D, it's your turn. Player D does their thing. Like, but that's because I had players who knew the game really well and all, you know, most of them were tactical minded with one being sometimes in the mood and sometimes maybe slightly less in the mood, but for the most part could still pay attention. And even then fights would sometimes still take a pretty long time. If you have three players 
who are not paying attention and one player who's really into it. Fights are going to take double the time, at least at least double the time. You're not getting three to four fights in a session. It's not happening, dude. It's just not happening. Yeah. Okay, you unless you're doing a dungeon you crawl. Like, even then, it's a, even it's an then, Omega dungeon. And I don't like, know. Three rooms of goblins, maybe. Maybe three like, okay. rooms of really easy fights, maybe. That's what I'm saying. But yeah. even then, to go even further, if you're going to play Pathfinder, Pathfinder fights take even longer. Yes, sir. Because there's even more modifiers going on and more effects going on in the background, and your players have more potential tactical options to do. Now, granted, Pathfinder does have a thing where you have kind of a set rotation and you stick to that pretty consistently. But if something happens in the fight where your character's like optimal rotation gets disturbed, you have to do a lot more thinking about what your next best option is. You know, for example, your ranger player, you know, does like the I don't remember what they're called, but like the aim maneuver and then the volley shot and then the attack. And let's just say they do that every turn. And then suddenly your ranger player, their bow is gone. Now they have to think really hard because they can't do their MMO rotation anymore. So now we're in a different situation. So like Pathfinder is going to take even longer. <laughs> like, <laughs> so don't play Pathfinder, my guy. This is not the group to play. Path I get it. Maybe you like the group. Maybe they're buddies. Maybe you don't have other friends who play tabletop, but I don't feel like this is the group to pay to play. Pa what the fuck? to play Pathfinder with. This feels like the mm -hmm. wrong group. <laughs> I'm going to no. be honest. I'm, I'm going to have to agree. It just yeah. granted. I'm extrapolating based on what this person wrote. I don't know for a fact. I don't know their players, but this feels like not the right group. And I, I know that if sucks. You, if they're already burned out, like on Call of Cthulhu and everything, instead of adding like D&D &D or Pathfinder or whatever, just go down to one game, choose Monster of the Week or D&D &D or flip I months, feel like yeah. Monster of the Week is the move here. That, I really genuinely, and I know uh, Josh suggests the Powered by the Apocalypse game. Of course he does. I know. But like, nerd, I feel like Monster of the Week is the move here. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> no, I, I actually agree. Based on everything I've heard of Monster of the Week, I've never played it, but um, Cardell, uh, hashtag Cardell underscore VA, uh, plays Monster <laughs> of the Week. Um, and he seems to enjoy it quite a bit. And based on everything he has told me about it, it this seems like a good fit monster. For your I think you should just rock it. Yeah, I mean, Monster of the Week is effectively it's a Powered by the Apocalypse game that's uh, going for the tone of like a Stranger Things or a Scooby Doo. But imagine if Scooby and Shaggy had guns, you know? Yeah, it it seems like Hunter the Reckoning. Yes, but for Powered by the Apocalypse. Yes, and, and to be fair, it, my my question is not to cut you off. Uh, if this this person wanted to get into fantasy. I'm I'm literally gonna immediately jump to Josh's side. Why not just play Dungeon World? Yeah, I mean it's basically the same system yeah, with some minor reworkings. Yeah, I feel like yeah. that'd probably be your best bet. It's a fantasy setting. It does everything yeah. you want. It's got the perfect number of players. Yeah, because that's literally what Apocalypse World, what Dungeon World says: three to four players. Yes. That's perfect. Yes, it does. Run that shit back, bro. Yes, like, I, I yes. This problem. This person may not know Dungeon World exists, but yes, I I, I think if you want to go more fantasy than. Uh, Monster of the Week is, which Monster of the Week already is pretty fantasy, but it's modern fantasy. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, Dungeon World is absolutely an option. The only problem Dungeon World has is just, it's it's a little old and a little bit content light, but you can fix that pretty easy. So, I'm sure there's a bunch of expansions. There's a, that people have there's made a ton of supplements world. people have made. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I, I know oh, Josh should just power the apocalypse, but like it, it. And here's the thing. Your tactical player, you already said you're catering a little extra to your tactical player. So just keep doing that. Yeah. Adding the maps like they said, you know. Yeah, that's fine. Because at the end of the day, man, if you're like, here's the thing. And, and I know this sucks because I, I, I know this position where you're like, I want to run game X players don't want to play game X. This kind of sucks because I really, really want to run it. I, I, I get it. But, you know, you can't force a group of players to play a game that they're just not into. And if you do force them to play a game that they're not, oh, excuse me. If you do play force them to play a game that they're not into, 
you're just it's just not going to be fun. Like, that's all that's going to happen is you're going to have a bad time. You know, like you're you, you're thinking to yourself, I really want to run. <clears throat> I really want to run Pathfinder. And even if my players maybe don't want to play it, I'm going to have fun running it because I really want to have, you know, I really want to run it. No, what's going to happen is you're going to try and force your players to run Pathfinder. And then even though you wanted to run that game, you're not going to have fun running that game because they're not going to be into it. So they're not going to interact with the system. So you're just not going to have fun. So like you can't force. And if you only have one player out of four who might be into that tactical shit, that's that's a 75 percent failure ratio. It's just it's just not going to work. <laughs> it's just not going to work. I'm sorry. I know yeah, it's hard. I mean, you have a higher chance of getting your your one player to enjoy narrative gameplay more, more than, than three players to, to enjoy the crunch. Three players yeah, to yeah, do tactical. Yeah, gameplay. exactly. And, you know, at the end of the day. So what do you do if you still really want to play Pathfinder to the Internet? Yeah. Find other people to play with, because you know what? These days it's it's a lot easier. And I know maybe people don't like to hear that, but it's true. You know, you know much much like a lady on the you know, a dating Ooh. app. You're getting players thrown at you. Yes, You're the it, meal yes, ticket. It, absolutely. Yes. The supply demand ratio as a GM is highly in your favor. Highly in your favor. Even even if you're playing a lesser known game, it is still insanely in your favor. Like it's crazy. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's actually a very good comparison, Matt. Um. Ah, shit, what was the last thing I was going to say? Ah, damn it, I lost the last part. But yeah, I don't know. It, it seems like this is not the group of Pathfinder. Maybe they'll like 5e. They may like D&D 5e. I could see the wiggle room there. Do not try to force a ton of encounters into session. Just do yeah. a lesser encounter type game and kind of go from there. I, Yeah. But again, I... Keep playing Monster of the Week. I just, yeah. <laughs> Monster of the Week. <laughs> even though I, I actually don't even like Monster of the Week that much, but I think in this particular scenario, I think it makes sense. Mm. I shouldn't say that. I don't like Monster of the Week as a Powered by the Apocalypse hack. I think it has some good merit, but as a hack of Powered by the Apocalypse, I think it misses the boat in, in some regards. But that's a, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because I'd be, that that's an hour long discussion. Fair enough. What do you think, gents? Should we move to number three? I guess so. Yeah. All right. And number three. This feels like Matt targeted. It does a little bit. May have. How do you handle unorthodox player actions that may derail the campaign? <laughs> this feels Matt targeted. <laughs> just a little, maybe a little bit. Maybe just a little. Maybe just. Gather around, kitties. Let me tell you the tale of the great joke. Okay. Um, if you would actually like oh, pause, the tale of pause, the deck of many pause. things, if you would actually like to hear the tale of the great joke, uh, there is a clip. I made a clip of the great joke on our YouTube. Go over to our YouTube and go listen to that video and you'll know what. Yeah, Matt, we'll put a link in the doobly. You'll know what I, I'm not going to I'm not going to guarantee that because I might forget. But I will tell you the great joke is on our YouTube. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. continue. Um. Yeah, campaign derail. Actually, you know, what I was going to say, uh, I've been having a lot of campaign derailments a little bit with uh, recent right. events with uh, with the deck of many things in my game. Mm. One That's player, right. One That's player right. got voided. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another player got dungeoned. Yeah, um, yep, yep. So I lost two players within a span of two weeks or two, <laughs> two characters. characters. Yeah, two characters. Characters, not players. Uh, so that's a whole lot of like future, you know, plans thrown out the window and, <laughs> and shit <laughs> but uh yeah honestly it's one of those things where as a dm you just kind of you see where it takes you with the derailment and again like I, i've said to josh multiple times like it's a you know it's make-believe it's an imaginary game world it can bend it can fold it can do whatever it can change on a dime it's make-believe it's imaginary it's fine it's you, you know Oh, everything's ruined. It derailed it. It's like, nah, it's fine. You just fucking, you know, you just play doh that shit up, flatten it out, and there you go. And your your once beautiful tower is now uh now square. 
Now it's a square. And then you have a square Plato. All these squares make a circle. Exactly. All these squares make a circle. All these squares make a circle. But yeah, it's it's not to it. Yeah, with the derail, you just gotta go with it. Go with the flow. Unfortunately, that's like my only real way I've been able to handle it. Uh, yeah, Matt just said what I was gonna say. Yeah. Basically, roll with the punches. If you're if you're if you're going to maybe I'll, maybe this isn't the right phrasing, but like if you're going to allow your players to do campaign derailing actions. And when I say allow, what I mean is you're not going to try and dissuade them or have a conversation. You're just going to let them do whatever they do and just, just deal with it after they do it. Then yeah, just kind of rolling with it is the move. Like player does some crazy wacky woohoo shit. And you as a GM go, okay, this is what we're doing now. It's great for improv. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, you just stuff. it will. Yes, it will make you very good at improv. I, I you would, just yeah, have to. I think the secret is to uh, sort of leave uh, wiggle room. Yeah, leave. Wi- yeah, leave legal room in everything you do. Like, yeah, regardless of what you what you write down in your prep, your session notes or or what you have planned leave wiggle room leave space leave an opening in your heart for the chaos and just go from there if you know you have those kind of players then just let the chaos flow into your heart let Mm -hmm. your ventricles pump with the madness let chaos rain the chaos rain yeah Yeah. uh, because well you know it's like letting uh, players doing campaign derailing ac- or not even campaign but maybe just session derailing actions that is a choice because at the end of the day you could just pause the game and say hey I know you're trying no. to do some wacky <laughs> woohoo fun shit but can we just like not right now please because it's going to derail things too much and I really don't want to derail I have a really cool thing coming up I promise just you just gotta let me keep going and not if derail you Thanos, it. Here. If you Thanos the mind crystal to me, it's gonna ruin the entire game. Right. And John has been waiting for his backstory. Right. Right. This whole time, and we're literally there. Could you not? Mm-hmm. Could you not Thanos the mind crystal? Right. And if the player says, "Oh, but I really want to do the wacky woohoo thing," it's what my character would do. That. Well, don't say that. But <laughs> if your player would wants to really do the wacky woohoo thing. That's where you start negotiating and say, okay, no, but what about X, Y, and Z? Or no, Hmm. you can't do it now, but maybe I'll let you do it later. Stuff like that. Because it's a choice. Yes, You are the GM. It is a choice to let your players do stuff like that. You are not morally obligated or forced in any way to let players do those kind of things. It's a choice. Mm Mm-hmm. It's your game. You know what I mean? Like, and it's also a choice of the players. Like maybe another player wants to do some wacky woohoo shit. Like, you know, the players are in the King's like meeting hall or like, uh, you know, uh, uh, what did they call those rooms where they would meet people to like have tea and discuss fucking foyer? Uh, not a foyer. They had they used to have these rooms back in the day that they would like discuss important business with fellow like Senel? Uh, maybe that's it. I don't know. Point being, you know, the players are meeting the tea, the king, they're having tea, they're sitting in the in the like the 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 audience room or whatever. They're discussing things that are going on with the nation, whatever, and then the rogue player is like, I wish to steal the king's purse or whatever, mm-hmm. or I'm gonna like I'm going to do something to greatly piss off the king, whatever that might be. I'm going to steal the crown that he put on the coffee table while he's not paying attention. And then all the other players say, can you not? We're having a lot of fun with the sort of dramatic Game of Thrones vibe that this scene has right now. We like where this is going. Can you please not completely derail this with your roguish bullshit? It's a choice to let to say yes or no. You know what I mean? Like it's a choice for you as the GM and it is a choice for the players to allow it to happen. 
So how many Curse of Strahd table stories have we heard exactly. throughout the years? I like of <laughs> Same like shit. the one player who just wants to hit shit yes. is sitting at the role play moment being like, I just want to hit the vampire, yeah. please. Yeah. To be fair, we have our very own one of those. We do. With Josh at Old Bone Grind. <laughs> we do, yes. So it's like, yeah, that's the thing. You as the GM and the other players are choosing to let it happen. So if you're choosing to let it happen, roll with the punches. If you're not yep. choosing to let it happen, then don't let it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, like. Yeah, and if anything, if one of your there's players five is like, people hey. at the table. <laughs> Yeah. Everyone gets an if, opinion. If one of your players is like, hey, I wasn't happy about that, or hey, this affected me, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, retcon it. You know, out of character. Yeah, retcon. Yeah, retcon, that retcon shit. it out of character. Talk to your group. And Rewind. Like, Yo. Rewind. And you know what? You could even make a joke out of the retcon if you want. I don't give a fuck, but retcon that shit. I think it's perfectly yeah. fine. That's all I, I, that's all I got on that one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, it was a shorter question, so it's fine. We have a shorter answer. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if you had anything to add, Isaiah, because you you didn't you didn't throw a lot in there. But oh no, I mean, I, uh, you guys pretty much said everything. Said I you said. were going to say, yeah. I am, yeah, I'm pretty fully on board with the player does something random, lol, just fucking go with it. Yeah. You know, like if you really have a thing you really really want to do, just level with your players and be like, look, man, let's I, just not I right now. It. I I get you. I know that you want to do it. It would. I would. I admit it's probably going to be really It'd funny. Be funny. <laughs> yeah. But I have worked for literally days on this. Yep. Please just do me this favor and don't steal a king's fucking crown. Please. Don't steal. I literally the, wrote the speech out. Don't like steal the spent, king's <laughs> crown. You guys have spent five five in game days, fifteen our actual real lives yes. working to befriend the king. Mm-hmm. Do you really want to throw all that away for a it's, crown it's that's worth five hundred? It's the Tom pieces. Carden thing. Where he's like, uh, uh, I catch vicious mockery, natural twenty. Let's go. And yeah. It's like you just happen to be. It's the prince who you've been chasing for. What was it? For it was a child. No, three, a child. Yeah, for five days and three weeks of our real di- our, of our out of game lives. That's the quote I was doing. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. literally that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if they still want to do it, just be like, Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, okay. You do the DM yeah, thing. Like, like, I, are I you sure about that? Because you. you always have yeah. one player. Whenever the well, DM says, "Are you sure about that?" or "Are you sure you want to do that?" There's always the one player that'll get the alarm bells yeah. while the other players are like, Fuck oh, it, this is going to be so funny. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, this is cool. He's stealing the crown from the king. Yeah, you yeah. have the one player going, I back away from the room. I leave. Yep. Uh, nope. I'm out of here. <laughs> and, and, and again, and again, if the player is really committed to doing some crazy shit like that, just say to them, all right, you can't do it this time. But next time I'll just I'll allow it carte blanche or something like that. You know, like yeah. make a deal with them. Negotiate. Yeah, and if yeah. that doesn't work, then as and if, a DM, you're like, okay, listen, there are going to be consequences for your actions. And if they're, you know what, if your player's being a dick about it, you know, maybe you need to consider the player. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it turns I also out the think, king was a level that, 20 that, paladin. <laughs> I think something that, that DMs don't consider, and it's fair, right? Because there's, the, the rules are, the, what's the, the fucking, the, 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 rules. the rules are the rules. Yeah. But like, <laughs> Your game has to function on some level of logic. It does, yes. If the king is like this wise old like ruler, he puts his fucking crown on the coffee table, turns around, turns back, and it's gone. It would make sense for him to be like, "All right, which one of you fuck? Like, I'm not that mad. It is pretty funny. Which one of you fuckers did it? Just this mop bucket on my head that gives me zero visibility. (laughs) Yeah, it's like you know, uh, they're not Skyrim NPCs. NPCs Yeah. yeah, the character in question could even have a laugh about it. It's like, oh, you, like, I, oh, I know you, you stole give it. me this curse artifact, you fucking. <laughs> yeah, and if the player's like, he doesn't know I stole it, you can just go, no, he doesn't know you stole it, but he knows he one, knows of, you one of you fuckers it. did it. It was there yeah. for like a two seconds ago. Come on. Yeah. Like, hey, Jimmy, the and Elder Knight, could you read me your magic bond thing? Yeah, sure. Oh, King snaps his finger, crown appears on head. Guards, kill him. Yeah. Guards, smack his nuts. <laughs> Blast his cock off. I sentence you to a thousand nut slaps in the in the yard. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> that's crazy. I I sentence you to one thousand testicular flogs. I cast <laughs> testicular torsion. It's just the guy with the it's just the, the, the executioner with the with the mask and everything, but he just has a little paddle. Shadow wizard money game. Have you s- Shadow wizard money game. We'd love casting spells. Um, <laughs> I, follow, <laughs> I follow he's a VTuber he's done some stuff for TTS his name is uh, Zoran the Bear 
and his oh, yeah, his yeah. VTuber is a wizard, and he <laughs> he's like the I cast a monstral cramps. <laughs> <laughs> it's like super basic. It was super so great. fucking I love that. funny. Yeah, no, that's good. Big fan, big fan. When you say it with the energy of of Leroy Jenkins, that I you know I'm in uh, mm-hmm. Joey Diaz, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in, motherfucker. <laughs> it's like you don't drink, but you eat toast for breakfast. I'm in. <laughs> All right, number four. <clears throat> A question for all of the hashtag D&D community. Mm. What is your opinion on a DM having a creature targeting a downed slash unconscious opponent? Is it a legit tactic for villains or a cruel method of DM versus my, a player mindset? Why is this still a conversation? This is the... Uh, the yeah, I don't know. Why is this, this is the still big a put debate? Put it on a t-shirt. The, uh, it depends. Yeah, it depends. Li- no, yeah. literally. Yeah, you, literally, you need a picture though. Of Ed from Ed Eddie. Yeah. Literally, though, Matt. Like, that's what I mean. Like, why is this still a discussion we're having? I don't understand. I, I guess Maybe it's because new DMs new don't DMs. know yeah. where the line yeah. is. Yeah. So, like, like it's. I, I don't know. I feel like because of time has gone by and like now it's just kind of common sense to me. But like, it does depend. It literally case depends. by case on the monster. If it's a boss monster and you tell your players like, "Hey, this guy is gunning after you," he will target down players if it's i don't know you guys are in the forest and you are fighting a pack of wolves and one of your players gets knocked out because pack tactics yeah uh, these dogs might dogs might either ignore the unconscious person or they might try and drag the unconscious player away to go and eat them later and so now your players have this like you know they're like oh shit now we have to rescue yeah exactly yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 is the creature sentient enough to understand tactical advantage? If so, then yes, yeah. it should attack the down player. If not, then no. Or if they're smart enough to understand tactical advantage, but they don't want to kill the player for their own reasons, then no. If they don't give a fuck, then yes. Well, it's D and D. Anything past level five, it's probably fine. They have a five. Well, also, I, I'm going to take this another step further and not even say that it depends on the monster. Or the situation, I'm going to take this to a to a meta level and say it just it depends on the game you're running. Mm. If you say to your players, session zero, you say, "Hey, we're going to do a very heroic, low lethality, role play heavy campaign," then don't attack your down players. Make it easier for them to survive. Right? Like, I'm not going to try to kill you and go out of my way to murder you all the time. Then don't attack your mm-hmm. down players. If you say, I want to run a high lethality dungeon delving, you know, getting out of the situation by the skin of your teeth type game, then you mm-hmm. attack your down players and you threaten their lives on a more regular basis. You pointed to the page it, where it says meat grinder in the campaign yeah. notes. And you're like, guys, look, the book Basically, says. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you want to say, I want to run a super lethal game, I'm going to give you persistent death saves that don't go away when you get up, you know, when you get from Ooh. downed. And I'm going to add exhaustion levels every time you get downed or something like that. Then you just say that. And then you consider whether you want to attack them while they're down or not in that scenario. you establish this kind of shit early on and as much as I find the death save mechanics of 5e to be okay but not amazing you know they feel a little like underbaked they're Mm. like they could use a little more attention it is a good dial that you can adjust to play with the lethality of your game without really doing a lot of work Example being attacking down players or not attacking down players is a way that you can adjust the lethality of your game. I don't want my game to be lethal. Okay, no monsters will ever attack a downed player. That drastic, that one change, which is not even like you didn't change the game in any way. You're just changing your decision making drastically decreases the lethality of the game by a lot. Conversely, I will attack players every single time they are downed greatly increases the lethality of your game. So, Mm -hmm. like, 
it's really just it's as simple as that and if you want to go a step further and adjust mechanics you can start adjusting how many death saves they get make the death saves persistent make going down you know potentially more dangerous you know for example in Baldur's Gate 3 when you go down and then get resurrected uh, the character that got resurrected doesn't have an action for their next turn they only have a bonus action Mm -hmm. that's one way you could make death more of a concern like i'm not being i'm not being heavily punished in any kind of persistent fashion but for my next turn i'm going to be drastically less effective there's all sorts of little ways you can tweak and adjust it it really like this is this is really a, a solved conversation i don't feel like this is up for debate anymore it's about style of game and how you want to like portray the the setting of your game and if you want to adjust it on a fight by fight basis then you just tell your players this monster you know zombies are going to attack you when you're down because they just want to eat your fucking flesh mm-hmm. the knights that you just I'm got flesh. into a fight with do not are not going to attack you when they're down because they want to capture and interrogate you like shit like that you know like it depends yep. God, we gotta make that shirt. We should make that a shirt, yes. <laughs> it depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah. It depends. Is it? Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking about the it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. I don't I I sound like I was mad there. I'm not mad. I just am like a little like uh, no, it, it, it is it is interesting and kind of confusing that it is still. Yeah, I'm just exasperated that this is like still a discussion, <laughs> I guess. Seems kind of like a 2018 conversation. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, there's something like that. Like, yeah. All right. Number five. <laughs> Number five. <laughs> Burger King is. Oh. Brett, when you do the thing. Ow. But do the, do the thing where it's only the first letter B in every word. You know the thing. <laughs> the fuck? What? Don't, if the, if he does it and the episode comes out, you uh, when the episode comes out, you'll know. I don't think he's going to do anything, but okay. I think he might genuinely. I, uh, Brett, you know. I, I don't know. Cut the bread being like, no, I refuse. <laughs> nah, fuck you, Matt. All right. Number five. <laughs> Title. One of my players was overwhelmed by choice when I, uh, I, God damn it. One of my players was overwhelmed by choice I had given them no, and what? it made no, him no, miserable. No, 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 so what, I had what, to call what? off the session. One of my players is overwhelmed by a choice I was give. Oh, that doesn't yeah. work either. Yeah. By a choice I had given yeah, them okay. and it made him miserable. So I had to call off the session. Unsure of how to accommodate moving forward. Uh, description. Oh, God. We had a session today. We play over Discord and Roll20, and the players got a climactic point. Quick summary of the situation. Maybe not super necessary, but for what happened, they are in a town affected by a supernatural plague. I already hate this. Yeah, right. Soldiers will burn the town down and kill all of the people at the beginning of the third day to stop the spreading of the plague. Sure. They had figured out that the priest was probably behind it, but because they had been a bit slow, they had ended up be, uh, they had ended up in a standoff during the night of the second day. Mm-hmm. They could either leave now and chase the priest who had eloped or fight the soldiers and save the town and risk causing a war between two cities that they uh, when they were threatened by the BBEG. While everyone was struggling to make a final choice, trying to sway some soldiers to their side, rolling, etc., one player got more and more miserable until I decided to pause the game to figure out what was going on. After some talking, assuring him that... uh, that his not having fun was perfectly valid and a thing we all care about and wanted to solve, uh, and that being miserable is not what the game is about, he said he felt overwhelmed and unable to choose because both choices seemed awful. When Mm. I asked if I should make choices less severe, even in cases where they had failed previously, I formulated this more more kindly, he said he thought that would just make the game less fun for everyone else and also would not fit my style. It is true that my style revolves around multiple parties ha- having competing interests and those causing difficult choices if not addressed perfectly. This has left me in a bit of a rough spot as I have no idea what to do moving forward. I want to be accommodating to this player, but he seems to not want me to shift my game too much and I am sure how to fully address this without making him feel like I'm babying them. 
Edit, the player just told me that they might have also, uh, it might also have been due to the, uh, in part, due in part, god damn it, <laughs> to sleep deprivation and stress. Uh, okay, we're just gonna ignore that last little edit pit. I don't, I don't, that's even worth. Yeah. Um, unless the uh, player Jesus has a Christ. third option, I, I don't really know, unless... Unless you as the GM then make a third option, but like that shouldn't my uh, that shouldn't really be on you. That should be up to the player who's stressing out about both options being bad. I don't like it. So let me come up with a third one or something else I can do. I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna be honest here. My immediate gut reaction to this entire statement is I I feel like I'm missing inf. I, I need more information. I have more questions to try and tackle this because my immediate thought was, you know, what was discussed at session zero, right? Like, did you establish with your group that sort of morally gray or ambiguous or difficult choices were going to be at the forefront? Did we establish that as a thing or or and I don't mean you had to literally say there's going to be morally great choices but did you sort of establish that things would be conflicting in this nature that it wasn't going to be a, a a straightforward good versus evil situation that's question number one question number two this one player is getting stressed out about about the situation what's going on with the other players you know because if all the other players feel like they can make a decision and aren't that stressed about this, then maybe just have that other player not really contribute and just let the other players sort of decide for them as a group and just let it go a little bit, you know? And then... I mean, okay, I, I get I will say kudos to you as a GM for like putting a pause on the game. Noticing the player was like having a having a little bit of a freak out. Good that you noticed that. That means you're paying attention, which is good. But I don't know. I almost feel like maybe you gave a little bit too much weight and too much attention to this. You know, like this is going to sound like a mean comparison, but you know, when you're, th when you have a three-year-old child that's having a tantrum, you know, you acknowledge they're having a tantrum, but you just let them have the tantrum and be finished. And then usually it was kind of over nothing and they're fine. Is this player having a stressy, but it's probably fine. You know, like, uh, did you maybe put a little too much weight into this? You know, is that just me? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like, uh, you know, assuming that we're, we're going to, you know, and you kind of have to, to some degree, buy into the stakes going on in the series. Um, Are both situations, are either situations good? No. No, yeah. But just because a decision's been made doesn't mean that decision can't be overturned or adjusted or changed. Or do something later to make it better or... Yeah, yeah, like if you if your players are just like, no, we're going to set up a barricade that way. We're not going to kill any of the soldiers, but they're not again in the city. Well, then there's no harm, right? Like they're they're going to be sieged, but there's a plague going on anyway. On anyway, you don't want that shit getting out. Well, uh, that's and that's even me getting too into the weeds. Right, right. Yeah, like, that's a player coming up with other ways to go about it. Let's just assume they only have these two to choose from. I. Like, yeah, yes, players have the freedom to come up with other solutions, which definitely, I mean, the fact that this GM noticed, uh, you know, one particular player stressing out about a thing tells me that this is also a GM who would probably be open to alternative solutions. So, you know, if the players come up with something better, then let them come up with something better. But, uh, yeah, I... Uh, it almost feels like you gave a little too much attention to one player having a little bit of a stress moment and that maybe you should have just 
kept rolling and they would have been fine afterward. You know, like, I don't know. There is a high chance. Of again, that. though, uh, again, because because we don't know about a, what the potential session zero discussion was. If this was really out of the blue and the game didn't have this tone prior, then I would understand the player being a little frustrated and mad or stressed out or whatever that I could understand. Oh yeah, totally. If it was like, whoa, 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 why it was, was like happy, lucky fun times. And then this got it, really right, right, dark. Right. If, what the fuck, if we were playing, you know, if we were playing Digimon adventure and then all of a sudden it turned into berserk, I'd be like, Hey, yo, whoa, wait, yo, whoa, what are we doing? Here? Hey buddy. Pause, 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 pause. No. Pause. Man, no. <laughs> um, but based on the statement, that this person said it is true that my style revolves around multiple parties having competing interests and those causing difficult choices that tells me that the game has been this way pretty much the whole time mm -hmm. i'm assuming i mean the gm could just be lying to us obviously but i'm for the sake of of pondering it i i would hope they're not just lying to us you know uh but yeah like Good on you for paying attention, but maybe you should have just let it rock. Yeah, so I, honestly, I, I'm, I'm happy that you keep bringing that up because it's true. Yes, honest to God, kudos to you that you picked up on that before the situation got out of hand and you mm -hmm. handled it very well, right? Um, obviously, there are some people who are going to call this cringe or whatever, but like, oh, it's cringe. Part of one, of, part, one of your one of your jobs as a GM is to make sure that your players are having a good time. In the same vein, your players are supposed to make sure that they are not ruining your fun because, you know, the power dynamics are far different, right? Yes. So the fact that you were able to uphold that really important, often overlooked part of being a dungeon master, honest to God, dude, that's awesome. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. but, and, you know, actually, it's, I said I was going to ignore this part, but honestly, the fact that the player admitted, like, to being in part sleep deprived and stressed. I think maybe the player is even a little bit aware that they cause more of a scene than they meant to potentially, yeah. you know? And also if all your other players are kind of fine with how things are going and one player is a little stressed out about how things are going. I mean, at the end of the day, it's 3v1. I don't know if you should accommodate one person over the other three, you know? I kind of, I really wish this person mentioned how the other players were reacting. I feel like that would have helped tease this out a little bit more. Because I feel like that's an important... Because if the other players are agreeing that they are also stressed out, then you have a different thing. But if the other players are really on board for the, like, difficult choice thing... Then, you know, maybe the one player just has to kind of accept like, all right, everybody else is having fun. So I'll just kind of sit back on this one because <laughs> mm. that happens sometimes, you know, like you're playing a game with a group of five people. You might not be always on board with what the other four people are doing, but at the end of the day, there's four people versus you. Reasonably, you have to kind of go with what the four people say, you know? Yeah. With, with within reason, obviously, if it's like a deeply traumatic scene or something, that's a different situation. You know, uh, if it's like if one player's character is getting like raped and beaten or whatever, then, you know, obviously the other three players being cool with it does not make it cool or whatever. But in this particular example Yes, this is very much rooted in sense and in sense and rationale. Yes, yes. If your players be are reasonable. acting inherently irrational, yeah. then be like, all right, pause. Yeah, yeah, actually. yeah. <laughs> like, not even joke pause. Actually pause. Actually pause. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have nothing all to right, say. Awesome. No, I'll be out of really. Yeah. Uh, number six. Number six. The Whopper. <laughs> How would you reward good roleplay slash backstories? How do you incentivize it? Description. Typically, backstories make me subconsciously play favorites. There are so many elements I can utilize in my stories if it's well-written or interesting. Sadly, though, not a lot of players are willing to put that much effort into their character, even if they do enjoy it. One thing I've always done to incentivize backstories is one of the following. Allow them items or contact points, con uh, points to be spent in exchange for people they knew in the past and where they would need them. 
bonuses or special boons slash feats flatly say they need a backstory. All right. I mean, right off the bat, I flatly say they need a backstory. I yes, I think yes. Yeah. <laughs> you should you should tell players if that's something you care about as a GM. You should tell players. Yes, you have to have a backstory. I care about that as a GM. And if you do this for me, I can make the game better for you. Motherfucker, write a backstory. Even if it's fucking half, you know, it's a paragraph. Whatever, that's fine. But give me something to work with. So, yes, flatly say you need a backstory. (laughs) So I I put this in here because this is sort of a me targeted one. I do and try to incentivize backstories actively right like uh-huh. every character every, every player in my games when they give me a backstory and, and the one thing i don't really care about is uh, if it's well written or interesting i can figure that out yeah as long head. as it's That's something fine. i can use mm-hmm. i just need something usable yeah and if you give me that you know characters have gotten special items customized gear uh npcs that they know uh you know more story beats that i i've sort of sprinkled along the way I'll give my players a mile and a half. All they nearly need is give me something workable. And the players who don't realize, oh, well, I'm not, I don't have anything. I'm not getting any of this cool, inter- like, and it's not even like the, the the material thing of like the loot or the item, but it's, I don't have any characters that know me. I don't know anybody. I don't feel like a character in this setting. And they will typically give you one. For some people, uh, like our friend uh, LP underscore versus, took him like three years to give me a backstory and in that three years he had nothing happen with his character really i mean i, I gave him stuff to do but like nothing, nothing deeply character related. driven in his character yeah. but he well, kind of had with to, the second i got he it accepted that l you know no yeah he he fully accepted it and was like yep this is my fault yep. um but the second he gave it to me i immediately figured out how to work into the story and we've had some fantastic payoffs since then Yep. Um, I mean, uh, I, I think we can kind of break this one down a little point by point here. Um, so typically backstories make me subconsciously play favorites. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. It's going to happen. Look, it, it's going to happen. If parents have favorite children, you can have a favorite player. It's I okay. mean, <laughs> even disre- like. You have a favorite character in a show. You have a favorite character in a book. You have a favorite character in a movie. You're going to have a favorite character in your tabletop game. You're going to have a ma- you're going to have a character. One of your PCs is going to feel a little bit more like the main character than your other PCs. That's just how that's going to go. And you're going to play a little bit of favoritism and that favoritism might be because of your backstory because of, or be, sorry because of their backstory that's fine it's fine as long as everyone else is still being as long as you're not ignoring the other players yeah you know you give one player a little bit more to chew on but here's the thing they gave you a little bit more to chew on so as a reward you give that back to them Mm-hmm. Like exactly. it's it's perfectly reasonable one player gives you a three sentence backstory run player writes you half a page the player who writes you half a page, you give them a little bit more attention. It's it's just, it's okay. Like I will fully admit, this is only really relevant to Isaiah, but like it, I I especially towards the end of the game, in in our campaign we just finished, I felt like Zephyr was kind of the main character amongst the group, more than anyone else. You know? Oh, interesting. I thought it was Leah. Uh, Leah felt like the Lancer to me. Interesting. So I thought Django was the Lancer because he kept I see giving that people really difficult questions to answer. I could see that too. But yeah, like I think uh, uh, Zephyr being Brett's character in my game, I think he just he latched on to the overarching narrative more than anyone else just by nature of the kind of character he made. But that doesn't mean that I like ignored the other players or anything or the other characters. It just meant that in my head, if I were to like write the book version of my campaign that, oh, Zephyr would be the main character, you know, and that just it just be like that. Like, it's just it's not a big deal. It's fine. Um, 
this per and then this person thinks uh things I've done to incentivize backstories allow items or contact points uh, which is say points to be spent in exchange for people they know in the past or where they need them or bonuses or special boons and feats I've yeah so I've it's, it's kind of like the powered by the apocalypse resource points you say like if you have a resource called you know research you go okay I'm gonna burn a resource point to know what this is I've kind of done something not similar how to that, that works in powered by game. the apocalypse not sure what you're referring to. Or is that Blades in the Dark? I don't know what you're referring to in that particular case. Power by the Apocalypse has a history stat, which is like I have a certain amount of history with this character. Um, no, uh, no, I, oh, okay, no, my bad. I, so I know it's it's Blades in the Dark. It was... Uh, I think it was Needle's like assorted medical kit. It was like you have charges of your medical kit and you can burn them to, to yes. fix like specific yes, problems. yeah. That's a yeah, that's a thing. I, 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 for me personally, I don't tend to mechanize backstory stuff too much, unless the game tells me to, because there are certain games. For example, Shadow of the Demon Lord has your uh, the player characters pick a profession, and when a player character's profession is relevant to the skill check you're making, you could give that player character a boon potentially or if it's the opposite of their profession they could have a bane so for example if your character was a surgeon and then a medical a medical situation comes up you might tell that player roll your intelligence and you have one boon because you were a surgeon so if the game tells me to i will give them mechanical bonuses if the game does not tell me to i generally generally not always generally keep backstory uh, like bonuses quote unquote into the more fictional space so for example uh, the fighter character was a soldier in the war that happened with the kingdom very recently and they were like a notable you know maybe not like a general but a relatively notable ranked soldier and then they meet another character who was also a soldier in that war I will have that NPC respond more positively to the fighter player or fighter character. Um, but I'm not necessarily going to say you have like a plus one or advantage or anything like that necessarily. I'm just going to say like fictionally, they're more willing to cooperate with you or listen to you, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Um, special boons and feats for backstory. I generally avoid, especially because a lot of games already kind of have a mechanic to cover that kind of thing. For example, in 5e, not in 2014, but in 2024, you could just pick a feat at level one that like represents a part of your backstory. Um, or if you're just letting your players play with feats at level one, for example, your player was maybe, uh, you know, they worked in a hospital. So you take the healer feat. That's fine. I'm not going to like give you an extra he the healer feat for free just because of your backstory or whatever. I generally try to keep those in the realm of the fictional bonuses. That being said, the the uh, the contact points, which is to say, like, spend points in exchange for people you knew. You can mechanize that way, but I think it's easier to just fictionally say, hey, player, your backstory is relevant to this town. Tell me an NPC you might know, you know, just mm -hmm. give me an NPC and then I will make them exist because your backstory is relevant here. Simple shit like that. You don't, if you don't need to mechanize it, don't, you know, because backstory is not an inherently mechanical thing. So don't respond to it with mechanical answers. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. And to be fair, uh, this is a lot easier to do in hellscapes because, you know, there's no magic items. You get the personalized gear, which is gear that has some like unique attachments to it. So if you are a sniper, and you find your like old service rifle, it might have like a silencer and a scope on it when a rifle in that game does not have those things. You know, it's a lot smaller in what it actually gives you. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's not like, ah, uh, yes, my family were a family of knights. I want the Holy Avenger. It's like, oh, hey, whoa. <laughs> right, right, right. I don't know about that, but you can get a plus one sword at level eight. Or, you know, level five, you know. The sword can evolve into a Holy Avenger later. Your higher yeah, level. that could work. 
for now, it's just a nice sword. Yeah. I mean, all right. I, it was just me. I just, I, I was just okay. I was the only one. What that you like? Don't. I was the only one giving opinions on that. I feel like neither one of you guys. I, uh, I tried, and then no, I mean, you guys I, talked I, over I, me, I, so I was like, yeah. My bad. I, I, I was trying to bring that back to you, but I yes. didn't. What, what were you I thinking, mean, Matt? I didn't. I didn't even hear you say anything, Matt. It's all good. Now, Matt. Now. Nah. What do you mean? No, I'm done talking. Nah. Now is when you talk. When I'm done. Next question. Matt, can you please just answer the fucking question? <laughs> uh, no. Right. Motherfucker, I'm gonna move on. Uh, all right. Yes, I mean, I, my points pretty quickly. Uh, actually, no, I think I, I mean, I, I talked more at the beginning. I think I pretty much said I was going to say, like, you, yes, you did talk in the beginning. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's not yeah. not as long as I did. Uh, I mean, this one is absolutely a Josh one. <clears throat> Number seven. <laughs> How should I pitch Dungeon World to D&D players? Pretty much the title, but I want to pitch Dungeon World to folks who only know D&D and want them to feel comfortable with trying something else without being too in uh, intimidated. It's like D&D, but cooler. Doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, actual answer. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, intimidated, I mean, that problem is solved for you from the jump uh, because Dungeon World isn't a much easier game to understand than 5e is. So they're going to be the opposite of intimidated. They're probably going to be pretty easily slide into that shit. There's nothing to be intimidated about. If anything, you as the GM should be intimidated by Dungeon World rather than the players, because the players can kind of just do what they were already doing. You as the GM have to shift how you run the game. But assuming you as the GM know what you're doing. How do you sales pitch it to players? I mean, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it is a paired, a more pared down fantasy game, heavily inspired by old school D and D, which is to say, like second edition basic uh, or Moldve, if you know that phrase. Um, that and it or. It is a game that emphasizes fictional positioning and the f the following the fiction of the game more than the mechanical prior to prioritizing that 5e does, which is to say 5e focuses more on the math and the numbers up front and then resolves the game that way. Dungeon World focuses more on the fiction, sprinkles in the mechanics and then focuses on the fiction again a way i've heard people explain this is that D, D resolutions go mechanics fiction back to mechanics whereas dungeon world resolution goes fiction mechanic fiction uh, back to fiction at the end uh it is much more narrative focused play so if you have players who get bored or annoyed by the fact that they want to do you know I would like to jump on the sa the chandelier and then cut the rope and then swing down and hit all the enemies with the chandelier. And if your fighter player says that in D&D, &D, you as the GM have to go, okay, um, is that a bonus or an action? Do I make them make a skill check? Should it take multiple turns? How much damage does the chandelier do? Whereas in Dungeon World, you would very simply probably say, all right, give me a defy danger roll to see if you land safely on the chandelier and do the cutting part and then as you swing down you know i'll roll you know maybe roll me like a d10 or a d12 of damage or whatever you can kind of ballpark the damage and then maybe give me one other roll to see if you land safely that would all get resolved very quickly because it would be fiction jump on chandelier cut the rope mechanics defy danger roll back to the fiction you plow through all the enemies you hurt them you do whatever damage they are now scattered across the room. You're on the other side of the room. What do you do now? And I think the main selling point is that Dungeon World feels more like a fantasy movie than D&D &D does because D&D &D is more of a tactical board game. 
Whereas Dungeon World is focused more on the sort of narrative and fictional play of things uh, in a whole bunch of ways. Also, if you don't like using battle maps and love to do things theater of the mind, Dungeon World is a perfect game for you because you don't need grids or battle maps or anything because nothing in the game is measured in feet or inches or squares or any of that shit. Everything is done via fictional positioning with a couple of range tags to designate how far or close something is to you. It's also a really good game to introduce players to role playing if they've never done any RPG playing at all. I think Dungeon World is a very good uh, gateway drug, if you will. Because players who are new to the game can often just want to simply describe what they want to do. And sometimes when you're playing D&D 5e, you try to describe what you do, but the action economy or the game systems get in your way. Whereas in Dungeon mm. World, you simply describe what you want to do fictionally. And then if there's a move related, you roll the move. If there is not a move related, you simply resolve the fiction as you would. I've had that with a lot of new players. I would run. Uh, I ran a one shot for one of my friends, Ellie. And so many, I can't even count how many times where she was like, I want to try and do this. And I'm like, yes, as a DM, I just said it happens yeah. basically. Yes. So like there was no rules or there wasn't anything yes. like action economy wise. And I'm just like, uh, you know what? Yeah, I can I can I can I can figure it out later yes. uh, how that works. Whereas Dungeon World is literally built around that concept mm. and Apocalypse World and many of the powered by the Apocalypse games are all sort of built around that concept. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. Play dungeon. I, I have very. I, I've only played Dungeon World, so I have no actual comment in this. But I, I knew Josh would have something to say. That's why I wanted to add. Surprise, surprise! <laughs> Josh has a lot to say on Dungeon World. I could go way deeper down this rabbit hole. I'm cutting myself off. Just, just so we're clear. <laughs> I could go further. Fair enough. Because I, there's also a lot of philosophy and game design concepts built into the Powered by the Apocalypse games that I find very interesting. Mm. But I will not. Turbo nerd type shit. <laughs> Fair enough. Hyper mega ultra turbo nerd type shit. I suppose is probably a better way to put it. Because <laughs> we're already it's doing turbo nerd shit. Number eight. The party has too many NPCs following it. How do I call them without seeming cheap? Build them all. Description. The NPCs act in combat. The problem isn't that they're powerful. No. They're very weak commoners who are treated like their own magic item by uh, reason of one feat or, or one ability. The problem is that there's an NPC for every party member, so the party's half of combat takes twice as long. If there weren't necessarily, er, uh, they weren't necessarily earned so much as added for story purposes to do one thing once, found in places re uh, wrecked by apocalyptic events, uh, so there isn't a natural reason for them to just say goodbye. How do I call them without it seeming cheap? You drop them I, off in the nearest town. Oh my god, dude. That's the only way I can, like, without killing all of them outright. That's the, that's the only thing I can think of, like, the fuck, uh, man. Again, that's a very in-game solution where I feel like this needs a slightly higher level res response to it. I mean, that is a way you could handle it in-game, in-universe, but Oh, man. I mean. Uh, bro, I don't even know. <laughs> like. This is just annoying. Like, this isn't even really bad. It's just kind of annoying. Right? Like. Yeah. I, I like, you know, I mean, I don't know. Matt, you, you, aren't you dealing with this problem literally right now? Or you were dealing with this? Uh, well, they're not like using them in combat all the time, so no. No, oh, okay. Well, I mean, I have a lot of NPCs in my game, but they're like, well, d or know, was it was it was it the the three year campaign where you had like they had a bazillion like combat allies? Uh, kind of, yeah. Well, so uh, we were using the stronghold and followers, the retainers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there was only a couple of missions where the players actually brought a bunch of them. Most of the time, it was I would have like five or six players. And then the Drake was the extra player. And for a while, I wasn't building combat with the full party in mind because I was like, oh, the Drake's an extra body, but it's an NPC. It's not really like 
an extra character. And then once I swapped it over to being a sidekick and I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm treating it like an extra player. And then my I combat's mean, got slightly better. <laughs> the, the the follower rules really tell you to treat it like an extra player. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, yeah, uh, yeah. In game, drop it off the next time out of game. Tell your players, yo, this is this is too much. This is, this right. is too much stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the in game thing, I, this player the or, or this this person seems to imply be implying that the idea of in game there isn't a reasonable drop them off at the next town type option seems to be what they're saying like that's not that wouldn't make sense fictionally I guess is what they're saying I mean uh, so this is a this is kind of a game design solution but one idea I just had uh, so this person made the comment uh, what does it say they're weak commoners who are treated like their own magic item by reason of one feat or one ability. What if what if you just make them a feat or an ability on the player character sheet? Like, oh, so you limit like the amount of attacks they can do no, to like a, something that a player has to proc. No, even more so than that, remove all agency of the NPC and literally just make the NPC a feat on the player's character sheet. Like, for example, right, let's say one of the NPCs is a farmer who has a big tower shield and the player keeps uh, having the farmer like interpose themselves between the player character and the enemy to like boost their AC. Take away the NPC's stat sheet, take away their autonomy and just say the NPCs always following you around player character add the ability to your sheet called interpose as mm. a bonus action give yourself plus two ac if you don't move for this round and fictionally what that is is the farmer with the big shield is defending you mechanically it's just another ability on your sheet which i know yep. feels really weird to turn npcs into like a singular ability but if that's kind of how they're using them anyway, then maybe that's just the move. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. Like, if they're treating them like magic items, then treat them like magic items. Right? And fictionally, you, you know, if you want, maybe every once in a while you threaten the NPCs. Or maybe you just say... I, fuck it i'm just not gonna threaten these npcs no matter what the whether what dumb shit the player does the the farmer with the big shield somehow conveniently always gets out of the situation just because reasons fuck it you know like if the paladin survives the farmer with the big shield survives i'm not gonna try and like kill this character or whatever you know They'll be, you know, still role play the NPC if you want, right? Like still role play that they're around and doing stuff or whatever. But mechanically, they're just an ability. Mm. This is another thought I had. I mean, if you want to call them, as you put it, it doesn't have to feel cheap. If they're assisting you in combat. Yeah, I mean, bad and shit a, could and, happen. And a bad guy just hits them. Yeah. Like, if they get wiped out in one, like, Fire Dragon's Blast, that, yes, that feels a little cheap, right? Yes. But, but if they die heroically in every, like, one of them dies heroically after every hard combat. Right, they keep going down. That's not cheap. Yeah. That's epic, you know? Yeah. Or, or another possibility, this, and this is, this is kind of what Matt was saying of, like, drop them off at the next town. Establish like a player base of some kind and have the players give all those NPC jobs at the player base because <laughs> most of the time, if players are utilizing ally NPCs in this fashion and you say to the players, hey, you can protect these new friends you made by uh, giving them a job at their base. Players are usually pretty happy with that. Like they like the idea of I've collected these NPCs during the campaign and I'm giving them stuff to do back at home and they're like taking care of the house for me. Players are generally a fan of that. I literally did that in my game. Not granted, it wasn't my idea, but it's literally what my players did where they uh, sort of kidnapped some NPCs and then they brought them home and then they turned them into employees. 
uh, sir, bested them in combat and conscripted them into uh, our forces. Yeah, you yeah. you know, it, it, was it a little unscrupulous? Maybe, but you know, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Look, sir, no. look, they are employees. They mm-hmm. were. We do not use the breaking wheel anymore. They were employees. We use the orientation statement. We prefer involuntary interns. I mean, listen, Isaiah's not wrong. They were paid. And given citizenship. Wow. <laughs> and given citizenship. That's true, actually. Yes, they were literally given citizenship. They were, they were literally paid wages, yeah. given free room and board. Yeah. Sounds like given some citizenship. communist propaganda to me. I mean, maybe a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, you know, but yeah, if, if it fictionally, if there's no scenario where you just can't, like, get rid of them, yeah, I don't know. I would just turn them into abilities if that's kind of how they're already being used. I think that just makes sense. Yeah. Shit, those motherfuckers got a 401k. They were tired, for God's sake. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> anyway. Those fucking jackalwares and that lizard kid had better health insurance than most people in that fucking city. That, you know, oops, that might be true. Hell yeah. All right. <laughs> it's just funny to think about. I just fucking it, it, it is. It is kind of yeah. I mean yeah. Their their lives uh, got turned upside down to say the least. Yeah. All right. Uh, where was I? Ah, yes. But nine. Number nine. Question: How do my pl- how do I make my players want to make the wrong choice? Interesting. Description: So I'm just starting a Stormlight Archive campaign. For those of you oh who boy. don't re- who haven't read the series, the characters become more powerful through speaking and sticking to oaths. But I don't want my characters to be able to do this easily. I want there to be incentives for them to break their oaths. Ideally, this is all done through the narrative I've set up. While some people in my group will choose RP at the cost of power, that's not all of them. If the player knows they will be rewarded with cool magical powers, then sticking to fake oaths in a fake game is easy, especially since sticking to those oaths is usually the morally right thing to do. I could do a GURPS thing where they would need to roll against whatever mental (laughs) torment the characters are struggling with, but that just feels lazy and out of player's control. I'm open to ideas. Uh, by the way, I I decided to run this in BRP. I don't actually know what that is. I don't know what that is either. BRP. Battle Royale penis. I'm going to go with no. Um, no I, I assume BRP is. is referring to the game system they're using, but I don't know it. Um, uh, side note, I, I'm just saying, Isaiah, maybe you should have looked that one up. But anyway. Oh, basic role playing. Ah. Oh. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, that checks out. Um, so, hmm. I mean, the, like the easiest solution would be like, you want your players to break their oaths, then you got to make the reason for breaking the oath very enticing, very shiny. You jingle the keys in front of them. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's that's the only you know, well, not the only, but that's like the easiest way. And it's like, yeah, you're gonna get cool powers, or you can get a, a boat. And it's like, oh shit, a boat. <laughs> oh, oh shit a boat boat's so cool <laughs> yeah yeah you, you Mansion, have to my own Tarask. <laughs> th- this is the thing about like uh honest work right honest work does not pay off immediately it pays off later on so if the players are like oh no if, I, if my thing is like I've, I've sworn an oath to silence but I'm the most persuasive person in the group and they need a boat to sail across the sea <laughs> and all the players fail and you know it's fair. You can make it a pretty high roll. It's it doesn't have to be easy. If they go, well, shit. What do we do? We really need this boat. And the player goes, fuck. I, I'll do it. I will. I will try to to persuade this guy. I'll break my oath because we really need this boat. Mm. You want to incentivize immediate results, immediate payoff, with the understanding that every time they take that immediate payoff, it's going to cost them later on. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, sticking to the oath has to have delayed gratification whereas breaking the oath has to have very immediate gratification because in in real life that is often the case where doing the bad thing will have more immediate gratification results but doing the good thing will pay you off better if you have the patience so what's yeah what's the uh what's the cause like short term games over long term uh I believe growth. it's short-term gain over long-term growth. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, you know, in a, in a in a in a somewhat dramatic sense, 
uh, if you wanted to make more money, you could just rob people on the street and you will get more money in the short term, but you could get arrested later down the road or you could work really hard at your job in an attempt to get the promotion that's coming up and get a pay raise. Obviously, the promotion's going to take a lot longer than just robbing motherfuckers in the street, but the promotion will probably get you the higher pay raise, get you a newer job, and also probably just make you feel a little more fulfilled in life than if you didn't, you know? So, yeah, think about it kind of that way. Also, the other thing is, you said... Some of my players would choose RP at the cost of powers, but not all of them. Okay, so the players who, if you already know which players are which, which based on that statement, it sounds like you know which players are which. The players who will choose RP at the cost of power, then you already know what to do. Make them choose RP at the cost of power. Easy peasy. Mm -hmm. The players who aren't like that, offer them something else you know they want. Maybe... You know, sticking to their oath gets them one power, or they could take the cursed great sword, and the cursed great sword is really cool and powerful, but it's cursed. A you know? plus three Vorpal sword that lets me cast disintegrate for right. free. Yeah, exactly. Give them the plus three Vorpal sword, but then eventually the plus three Vorpal sword controls their player character's mind, takes them over, yeah. and they lose that character. Like just like, all right, Jimmy, add one point of corruption to your character sheet. What does that mean, DM? You'll find out. You'll find out later. I don't like that. Exactly. Like, I, don't, exactly. I don't like that yeah. at all. Yeah, exactly. If you have players who you know won't choose RP, then just tempt them. Fuck with yeah. them. Give them the power they want. Yeah. I think this is actually kind of a, uh, a good problem to have. Honestly, yeah. it sounds like you have a pretty good idea in this. Mm -hmm. So, like, this seems like a good problem to have. One day I'll yeah, get to finishing the Stormlight Archive book. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I got through the first two chapters and then was like, my brain hurts. I have an I'll owie. Reading is hard. And then the Murtag book came out and I'm just like, <gasps> Aragon. Maragon. <laughs> yes, middle school <laughs> grade level. This is more my speed. <laughs> Matt, don't admit to that on the internet. <laughs> Tries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah. All right. Number 10, and this is one I was really interested in. Nice. How do I make psychological horror in D&D? I always wanted to make a psychological horror D&D session since it's my favorite genre. When I made a D&D campaign where every session is based on a different genre of horror with an extra session or two if I needed to wrap things up, I knew it would be the perfect idea. I soon realized I didn't know where to start. I tried Googling it but couldn't find anything. Let me know if this idea is any good, and if so, what steps you should take, uh, what steps I should take to go about this. Sorry if this is a dumb post, I'm new to DMing, and tell me if this is a bad idea. I'll take the post down. Uh, it's set to the 60s of it, yeah, none of this is um, uh, They also made their own insanity system, similar to Call of Cthulhu. Okay, because the person asked, and literally said, uh, tell me if this is a bad idea. Yes, this is a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This is a bad idea. There's a reason but, people make fun of the madness because and everything. I, in, yeah, yeah. Like because, in the DMG. Because Isaiah gave me the two rules. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be one hundo. This is the one where I'm going to go play a different game or just don't. Uh, but because Isaiah said I'm not allowed to do that, I'm going to have to come up with a different no, no, We can put it up to a vote for for just don't. I will put it up to a vote. This feels like a, to me, this feels like a just don't. I, w I will say there's some stuff from the Van Richten's guidebook that helps, I, but you're not going to get the full experience unless you're literally like, OK, guys, um, you're all you're level three for the whole campaign. I, it's just like, I, uh, well, oh, my God. Fuck. Yeah. I, like, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, like as soon as you start getting to like, I can punch the bad guy twice at level five or the monster twice. And it's just like. And everything's ruined. Sick. I hate it. it, it like, okay. The, the, the thing is, psychological horror as a genre, and I don't know if this person understands this or not, but, but, but psychological horror is 
predicated on the idea that your characters or or the characters are relatively powerless. Yeah. D&D characters are not powerless. They're just nope, not. It's a power fantasy. It's, it's a power fantasy. D&D characters could kick Cthulhu in the balls and piss on his corpse. There they're they're just one, not powerless. <laughs> there is that one adventure from Candlekeep Mystery that it's not fully psychological horror, but it is horror in the aspect of like, you, no matter what you do, you cannot kill the monster. It's specifically yeah, designed yeah, the stat yeah, block yeah. that you have to follow the ritual and everything to beat it. Yeah, and I mean, it. step one. Yeah, step one. You can't let your players fight the horror, like physically fight it. That's just not. No, that's just not on the table. You just can't. It just no matter if what. your players can stab Cthulhu, everything's down the drain. It's just not going to work. A- well, actually, again, I, 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 this is a bad idea. I interject something. Go ahead, mm. fine. I think you should, if if you want your players to be able to fight it, because you know D and D has fighting in it, <laughs> game about fighting. Huh, yeah. mm-hmm. Do the Mister, uh, what is it? The what's it, Mister T? Uh, <laughs> the Mister X thing. If you deal thirty damage to it, you stun it for a round. I and, or do, make it fifty damage. Make it something that every player, if they were swinging as hard as they could, could accomplish in one round. I but that they can't do that every round. And they're gonna run out of resources. But like and make it's... it like a you have to let's say the rogue has like a there's a door out of the haunted mansion, right? Mm. And they're picking this lock, and it's gonna take several rounds because they just they're not able to get the roll right. And then you have the fighter and the cleric and the wizard smash Mr. X with everything they have. That rogue's got like three turns maximum before Mr. X suplexes one of them to death. You know, uh, m- mm. he, he's referring to Mr. X from Resident Evil 2, in case anyone's yeah. a little confused on that one. Yes. Um, I mean, sure. Sure. That's somewhat of a thing you could do. The important thing, though, is they need to have a different objective they're trying to complete there. Like there needs to be some other option, because if there isn't another option there then they're just kind of bonking him on the head for no particular reason. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, like yeah you know, the funny, players... I actually watched uh, I watched a live play where they literally did the Mr. X thing and surprisingly worked out it can work the thing is, is you just really you need to take players power away and D&D characters are inherently very powerful so you need to do something that puts them in a situation that they can't basically you can't let the, the wizard solve every problem with fireball right like, the wizard the can just fireball to, everything. It's not yeah, going to work. The player should be able to hurt the monster but, or do something like Isaiah said. The they should be able to delay it. But they delay it. They yes, can't that's the perfect kill it they can't, or they can't. No. They can't kill they can't it or harm permanently. It, they can't defeat it. Yeah. Unless you, again, do a ritual or you follow the steps or, hell, you might not ever be able to kill it. You just have to Maybe the ritual it enough just pauses to, it. Yeah. Or you just have to delay it enough to escape and then you just fuck off and you're like, all right, this yeah. thing is out there in the world somewhere, but we're not going back to the area. It's, yeah, it's because <laughs> at the end of the day, if we're never you, going back to Crystal Lake <laughs> at the end of the day, if you like such psychological horror, then you must be aware of the fact that at the end of every Lovecraft story, they don't like kill the Cthulhu monster. They just don't you lose usually like you lose like, or, you, or you go mad. Yeah, you go crazy or the main character sort of gets away by the skin of their teeth, but they don't ever like mm. kill it or hurt it, you know, because if you could kill Cthulhu, then Cthulhu is not that scary, yeah. right? Cthulhu is only scary because he's nigh invincible. Like that's one of the main. I mean, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the main things that makes him scary. And I listen, I don't like sanity systems, but if you want to do a sanity system thing, then fine. Do a sanity system thing. I would advise against it, but I would like if it was better, but I just uh, don't. Yeah, I mean, don't use the one in the DMG. That's for sure. You make up your own system. I like some of the person said they did, but they're not. They're not like great long term effects or anything. Yeah, Yeah, they just get annoying is usually what the problem is. So like. (sighs) Yeah, 
You have to restrict the player's power. They can't kill the monster. There has to be some long-term detriment. And I think you kind of have to focus on the existential dread of the whole situation. You know, the idea of infinite space and infinite darkness and unknowing chaos like that kind of shit like you can't let the players understand what they're fighting particularly well either right part of what makes lovecraft lovecraft is that nobody really knows what it is or how the monsters work that they're dealing with for the most part you know like we don't know what cthulhu's backstory is you can't tell them cthulhu's backstory that kind of ruins the mystique but also, goddamn, just play Call of Cthulhu, my guy. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know I'm not supposed to do that. I know we're trying to not do the thing of saying play another game. So, you know, t- take all those other things. Yeah. I mean, look, we, we gave it an honest to God answer. So yeah. just play Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah, that's my actual answer is like play Call of <laughs> Cthulhu or something like it. <laughs> because one of the big things about Call of Cthulhu is that player characters are fairly powerless like they can't do that much Mm. yeah Mm. again though yes this is a bad idea I just want to reiterate but but doable you're going to jump through a lot of hoops a lot of hoops so many hoops just absolute dog show level of hoops (laughs) all right just throw a straw at your uh, level three players that would be hilarious. That's also kind of <laughs> funny, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, that, that's probably all the time we have. I actually do have more of these. We might, we might do know. another episode. Uh, uh, homeboy got too many of these. Goddamn, goddamn. Yeah. They'll, they'll never stop. The Reddit will just keep coming. Uh, all over the floor. And they won't stop coming. And they won't, stop coming, and they, and they they won't stop. clean actually, it up either. Like, goddamn, get some I, towels, you animals. Uh, I do want to do another one of these, so we might do not the next time my turn comes around to host, but the time after that. I'm going to say it now for any of our friends watching. Uh, in the no, coming days, what, I'm what? going to put out a... <laughs> don't, don't, don't say it live on air, what? He's doing it live. Yeah, I'm putting out a poll. Okay. Uh, oh, shit. We're going to do uh, Shit Takes Episode 4, Defend That Shit, Viewer Edition. So any of our... Uh, any of our friendly viewers or friends who are just aware of the show want to get their uh, their controversial takes uh, roasted in real time. Oh God! Or uh, supported. Or supported. Uh, I will be putting out like a mm-hmm. like a little Google questionnaire thing and sending it around. Nice. My players will be very very. Oh enthused. God! Oh my God! All right. Make sure can't they're make sure they're anonymous. Fired. I can't wait until each one of them is going to yes, be like, yes. tell Josh to play Pathfinder for love of shit. <laughs> they, they will be anonymous no. um, unless you want to mark no. it as yours, in which case you're a champion. Nah. But it's going to be. An, I mean, look, if if they write in the questionnaire, by the way, this is Brett. I can't stop that. No, but I would say I would recommend against it. I suppose you can't, but I would recommend against. It. Yeah, I. you shouldn't. But if you really feel the need, I, do you, my guy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. If you enjoyed all this dumb shit and my screaming into the microphone, follow us on Twitter. Jace, follow us on Twitter. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah pretty much. I need to piss. Um, and to a hundred more. Oh. Yeah, happy 100th episode, motherfuckers. Woo! We did it. Sure. Time to retire. Sam and see if he'll join us for uh, Shit Takes Four. <laughs> Retire on chat time. Right? <laughs> Ret- retire live at the end of this episode. Yeah, we're done. We're done. Fuck That's y'all. it. We're calling it. We're actually canceling ourselves. <gasps> and you just say, like, the worst thing ever. <laughs> you but just say some outlandish something racist <laughs> off the cuff. Yeah, something super bad. And you're just like, oh. All right, gentlemen, shut up. We're trying to finish here. True. All right. That's all we had. Peace, motherfucker.